trees. Pink and blue, you might know, I went on without remembering. We stopped at the store, standing by your window in pain. I looked back, in our car, at Ed, blue and yellow lights in my eyes. What was over me? Home we expelled them for social. Forget it. We built a fire, cooked on the stove. I think I burned an egg carton. But triply, I liked the red wall near the stove, and lit the stove, too. Made the sink white and the counter glow copper with pots on it. Cooking our dinner, flames all over the place, all lit, nothing on them. And lights all over the place, interrupted windows, blurred lights, beginnings of diamonds. And in the bathtub, some light shining down on the tub that wasn't there. I should have stayed with people, I guess, to avoid all over the place. Twenty-one. Eighteen minutes to nine on our way to New York. Had to switch to AM. Morning. Mist and shaft light pictures. We're going fifty-five to sixty MPH. Being careful cause of cops. What if notebook were confiscated? Now fourteen before already. Mist. Cold. Freezing. Drive to K's with top town. Calm cows. Nearer to city, my God. Eggs at K's. Settle on for F and J. Separately. Ed and Jay's sunglasses again, cool, driving blue flowers by side of road. Bill Macy is 48 or 49, dead animals, Brian Pond Road that way, state police the other way. Rolling, rolling through the USA, California. You can trust your car to the man who wears the star. Kay says I look pretty last night, see you later, my pretty red feet. Shoes on the dashboard. Gas station, blue towel, tissues, coffee, double stamp day was there later. Was there water, a body of it, next to the picture of the highway, taken just before Hawthorne Circle? We go south to Argentina, from Massachusetts down to New York, to downtown, to uptown, to back down, to R. Wood, to E. Hearst, back to E. Uptown, north to Massachusetts, one day. Hot car city, strange, stage. Sunglasses spaced out, light, no registration for this car. Again, the notebook, confiscated. I'm pulled up in front of he's pulled up. A ticket, confiscated as evidence, evidence against me. See more. Port Authority, a hundred feet, crazy game, round and round. A Puerto Rican guy stand, standing, sitting, hands folded by building. Dante's Inferno, books in the back of the car. GP, temperature 101. Buses going round and round in circles, a hundred feet in the air. See Paul. He goes to the Avon on the Hudson Theater to see some kind of trip. This car, that guy's Jeep, saw it twice, number on the house. Ridgewood E. Hearst. Another week in hospital, Mrs. Sampson, K&L, test roll. We both look fine, wiped out. Five dollars worth of gas. The nurse's room, K chews styrofoam. There's a piece on the floor under the driver's seat. She's here in New York City today. Back to the country. Paul will cut the negative. People who know me, what a relief. Not like queens full of limping men. This is too hard. I think I feel bad, but I never felt better, like the day we drove from Massachusetts to New York and back the same day. How did we do it? We thought we felt. The night they drove old Dixie down and on. The house is dark. It's strangely quiet. Maybe I don't know how to work anymore. When you awake, you will remember everything. Tyrone Power in an instance of total recall. Nightmare Alley. He gets screwed, but goes back with the carnival and finds his wife, who'll take care of him. The great Stan become a wino. When you awake, she bet on one horse to win, I bet on another to show. Answer, maybe that's how I survive. Cigarettes should be better than dawn mist on the meadow. It was a golf course, the most beautiful meadow in the world. We pick up Kathleen early and took her car. Left Jay hours. She wanted to leave at night, but we picked morning, about 7 o'clock. This is the day Ed got the ticket for making a wrong turn in New York. They took away his license since for not coming to court. Anyway, the meadow mist is frozen. But this first meadow is the meadow of the $4,000 an acre farm. Before we met Kay, we stopped many times for the mist. Eyes. Two trees. And at the corner where we make the turn onto Cobb Road, the cows were acting like sons. Only two of them. The others looked right, but with the cows like sons, we didn't miss the sun to our left. It was in a tree. 
Maybe the reason for the cows was this, reasons. It must have been about time. X, X, success. Just after dawn. You couldn't get that one, Kay said to me. I got it, but better. I made a tree longer and rested my thoughts heavily on a light morning mist to make it clear, but not before I could push it. It's pleasure, sun still in a tree. We're not bored. Mist is always in the distance, but mirages behind trees are tails, blacken out outline, make less real windows. Music stopped. I quit. Little thin branches are clearer than the air, all light in red break. I looked at the tree with the sun in it. I looked across the road into the meadow, golf course. Then further away from that tree, but still facing it, I turned around. A different shadow lengthened out. I made a different tree longer, almost like two twins. I was close to the car. It was too cold to leave the door open, this spot. Should I have stayed there all day, or was this moment the only one when rays directed everything but me? And so me, rays like stick, stick matches, but something must rest on them for it all to appear, and we did. You depend on things above the ground. Your, pe your pleasure puts a pressure on them. You don't believe they're there. You do. A mirage is a challenge to anyone who looks at it. When you're in a hurry, it better go on. The picture might get too hot and burn before your eyes. Over the windshield of the giant car, the little camera can see nothing. I ought, I just saw a light go out in my peripheral. Finally, three coffee cups steaming up the car. We stopped at the, I got caught, chief, Taconic Diner, just before the entrance to the Taconic. We had told Jay and Kay to get gas the night before, but they didn't. There were people in their car, B and T. It was embarrassing to yell, get gas, like talking to grandfather. But how can you elaborate on that when you're blunt? We had sweetheart cups. A ten dollar fine for littering. No, we're already on the Taconic. Ed is waiting in the car. How tired he is he? You have to walk so far to get the coffee. The Tampas. This time, no, not that early in the morning, but maybe. And here's the proof. The first gas station on the Taconic. We had made Kathleen eggs, I think, at her house. The sun's up as we go down. But it's on the same side. Usually, when we go up, it's going left, or right, that is. We get as far as Ossining. For a while, I put my moccasins on the front windshield to dry. The road widens. Would I have time to have a child? Hawthorne Circle is a big mud puddle. We move. That was the day of the Pampas, because now at the Circle we encounter a flagman in a straw hat with an orange vest on. To see him, I guess, his flag is orange, too, and he's foreign in some way, and I say to Ed, there's the Pampas, all right, the Argentine Pampas, and he agrees, but is too tired. Why that man? That man could have braids or a ponytail. Everything is under construction. Arrows, orange men down the west side highway. Two views of Twin Towers. We're about to get off at 18th Street, I guess. Kay's going home to sleep. On the road, down 7th. What a mess. Law office. George A. Mango, attorney. Next to a shoe store, closed for a whole month on vacation. June 7th to September 7th. That's three months. I think this is across the street from R's house, but we were just passing by. No, I'm wrong. Ed dropped me off here, or I dropped him off and took the car. Yes, this is the day we cleaned out Ridgewood and I had the car. Those strange tops of houses in Ridgewood that look like soldiers grown out of the ground. They look crooked but are so straight you hate them. Across the street from our house and out the window, nothing. Except they've taken the broken glass off the top of the one-story garage next door. They used to put it there so that people wouldn't go up. I mean, kids, us kids, wouldn't go up after balls that would go up there. Hoping, I guess, in the meantime, to keep us from playing ball against the garage. I don't know why it had no windows. The gate, down on it, looks cheerful. Not the house next door, but I know it isn't. Couldn't be old people used to live there. Now somebody else. They, there's still tree and iron gate with lots of room in them. Garbage cans inside hooks on the gates if you want to keep them open. Our private space. Can I come in? What a day this was. I remember I was singing, summer, fall, and so on, to avoid thinking about what I was doing, throwing everything away. Our gate less cheery, but amiable. No, not much. I wish there was a band there. The houses across the street, Mildred or Muriel, used to live there. As a matter of fact, she owned one of them. 
My uncle was interested in her, never seriously, because he always said she was a woman of means. She worked as well and could support him. I guess he felt totally something, the fancy cornices, some asshole kid in the backyard next door, and a whole row of nearly hung wash, identical pants of different colors hang together, shirts, then one sheet, then towels, then larger shirts, the man of the house. This sucks. Flower patches enclosed with ellipses of white stones down on the whole whole line row of wash lines, most of them empty. It wasn't wash day. TV aerials. I used to, A, always wonder why we couldn't make one long park out of the whole thing, behind people's houses, so we could run in it instead of just being able to squat, squat and make mud pies. Find little corners you never knew about. All it would amount to is taking the fences down and agreeing not to cultivate asshole rose bushes, etc. We found a snapping turtle in the backyard. Fuck this. The yard on the other side, just a big lawn with flowers, and other stuff on the outside, and one clump in the middle. The same white painted stones, things glistening in the sun, but who gives a shit? I picked up Ed at Arnold's, and Paul got in the car, impressed with me and my Cadillac. We, we had gone to the hospital, too. We dropped off Paul at a dirty movie. I took his picture going in, but you can't see him. Adultery, that's how they put it. A-D-U-L-T-R-Y, like sultry. We parked on some street in the East Fifties and dropped off some film. The sky was clear, I guess. It was a beautiful day, all day, but fuck it. And we started uptown on our way back to stop off at Ed's parents. Well, they weren't letting anybody on the highway because a fire in the Penn Central yards had made part of it collapse. So we went on and on, up different streets, Riverside Drive, Upper Broadway, we stopped and had a coke, changed drivers, the car didn't break down, but a lot of other people's did. And it was a real pollution fantasy day. We were sick and dizzy, took a picture. I thought it would look like the end of the world, but it didn't. It looked beautiful. There was nobody going the other way, just our way, and a lot of people thought a lot of people were crazy. I was driving when I told Ed, take a picture of that behind you. So he did, down a hill, but the pink and purple insanity of it didn't register on film. But we put another roll in just to ba break the rules. There's a picture of crushed old cigarette pack, must have been in somebody's pocket, and matches from the Red Lion Inn on the dashboard, and reflected in the windshield, the car reflecting some giant Riverdale apartment building, and a view down 231st Street, with the setting sun much brighter than I remembered it, stopped for a light. And then we had some dinner and stayed a long time in Riverdale, left way after dark for the trip up, speeding, repeating ourselves. Each of us could only drive about half an hour at a time. Stopped at Jay's and went home, I guess. Twenty-two. The men are out at the Moviola. Two pictures from last night and this morning's roll. How did they get there? Forced myself to sleep and forget dreams, whatever they were. Made GP, night and fog, map and sleep for Ed. Slept in yellow room with St. George in the other room. You do have to come, quit. Be alone with trips, be with, be alone. The Bastion Blessing Company, Chicago, Illinois. Knee James Soda Fountain, all dry soda fountains, patent pending. Parmesan cheese, cheddar cheese, eggs, canned milk, bread, corn. Recovering today from long something where part of the West Side Highway fell down. Perry Mason is on TV, powder on the floor. Incredible cars on all the uptown streets, fires in the railroad yards. July 22 today, Thursday, only eight more days and I've moved to the cellar in squeaking, rocking, stuffed chair. And yesterday, after we made it uptown, stopped at Ed's summer parents' house. They'll come up the 13th. Grace is going to New Mexico the 10th. We'd like to go to California in September. We can visit Halifax in September or October. E's father, Big E, suggests Arcadia National Park in Nova Scotia for camping. T seems still to be living there. Don't know. We see Big E's new car in the garage across the street. He sees our 1964 Cadillac. Drive north, insane. I'm in the cellar when I'm not driving. I'm thinking, seeing, 
GP and the other old men looking like movies of a concentration camp. That's where Nod and Fog comes in. And GP, what can we do for him? Grammar. Looked old. Pictures today. Catalogued them. This chair. Chased some spiders away. North. Dark. Top down. Talked a lot about the bright. Talked a lot about the brights to stay awake. Got to Jay's. Him and some other world. Our struggle to get up there. I went outside, caught my fingers in the front door, then in the car door, and cried. Transferred everything from one car to the other, crying. Had dropped cigarettes in my lap on the way up, went upstairs to the yellow room and slept, slept. In the morning, forced sleep, and on and on, and Grace came on the 405 bus in front of Knee James. Hot sun, orange soda. Mailers to Kodak and Zayers for frying pan and sunglasses stopped at Berkshire Broadcasting. No black magic. T's going to some kind of wedding this weekend, and Paul and Barbara will be here. No bed for them. And Ed, one, two, three, four, and Ed's at the Shaggy Dog Recording Studio. He's leaving on the next plane, 7 a.m. to New York, and the house is here. Grace in the loft, and she's fixing tea. And all the stuff from Ridgewood is down in the cellar. Itchy, burnt, bitten, and switch over to number two. And Jay liked the films, and Harriet encouraged not to come. Want her money back? Nudity, vile language, an omelet, creamed corn, brown bread. One, two, three, four, tomorrow's Friday. The queen is here, the ice is here, and everything's fixed and ready. I quit. The soldiers quit, and times have changed, and the actors quit, and the movie cameras quit, and silence has quit, and Grace is watching me. And the sailors quit, and the engine quit, and the milk quit. And I'm waiting myself, and money quit, and I myself quit, and colors have quit, and music quit, and the end quit, and the door, it quit. The first thing is a tree I saw when I was parked at the radio station. Still looking for old black magic, I think. Ed went somewhere, or maybe he was with me. I went up Route 7 to Stockbridge to arrive in time to pick up Grace coming on the bus, Monument Mountain. Bus Monument Mountain, what was that? The result of a director's viewfinder in two dimensions instead of three. I had been to Zayers that morning, bought stolen sunglasses, picked up Grace, saw Lenny, who was looking for another Grace, not one with red hair, bought pens. We went home, ate an omelet, lying in the hammock. M was there. By then, Ed took his shirt off. We had coffee and Canadian oat bread. Also, Ed and the light behind. I had brought the good coffee one of those days in the city, yet Ed gets in the car to go somewhere in Jack Donahue's baseball camp shirt. His hair was wet. He made a face, drove off. We stayed home. The trees grow on the stairway now. I went outside to watch him leave. I went back inside, sat on the stairs, lay on the floor. I went back outside and stood on the cut-down tree into logs. I went back in again and upstairs. I went out on the upstairs balcony, perhaps to, sh to show G. Looked inside the door to the bathroom, was part way open. The light was on. The sun was beginning to set. Like eating a lobster, you dip it in butter, eat one part of the meal at a time, one meal a day, as three meals a river of butter. I showed Grace the automatically revolving TV antenna, the lights reflecting to infinity on both sides of the bathroom windows, and more. Did M come home? I went down to the basement to work, maybe put the stuff there, the basement ceiling, the light, there, spider webs and the spiders who run them. Grace went up on the balcony, picked a place for herself. We had bats all this month in the house, I guess. Grace took a bath. Her back, were her toenails painted? No. The water was yellow. The light was yellow. We fixed spaghetti. The smoke of Grace's cigarette went up into the exhaust on the stove. G had a green blouse on. Maureen O'Hara, we watched TV. Some mystery about a vase. A piece of porcelain. Janet lay, her hands clasped, resting demurely on the table in evening dress. I suppose she's watching Jack Webb play the trumpet and further on in space some interesting shots of morning, and through the trees, in a movie favoring the French royalist underground, you were supposed to be on their side with Tony Curtis or Tyrone Power. That house now seems boring. Grace's bed. She had brought her new tape recorder, played for me some 
music from Haiti, I think, dances. Listen to this. Home interiors at night, areas with bright light, areas with average light, candle-lighted close-ups, indoor-outdoor Christmas lighting at night, brightly lighted downtown street scenes at night, brightly lighted theater districts, Las Vegas or Times Square, neon lights, neon signs, other lighted signs, store windows at night, flood-lighted buildings, fountains or monuments, distant view of city skyline at night, fairs, amusement parks, fireworks, displays on the ground, night football, baseball, racetracks, basketball, hockey, bowling, a separate category, boxing, wrestling, stage shows, average lighting, bright lighting, circuses, flood-lighted acts, ice shows, flood-lighted acts, schools, stage and auditorium, swimming pools, indoors, tungsten lights above water, churches, tungsten lights, Bright sun, hazy sun, cloudy bright, no shadows. Heavy overcast, open shade, lighted by a large area of sky. Bright sun, cloudy bright, no shadows, heavy overcast and open shade. Brilliant scenes, backlighted close-ups. Skylines, 10 minutes after sunset. Interiors with bright fluorescent light. Brilliant scenes, such as those containing much sand or snow. Ice show circuses, spotlighted acts, carbon arc. Brightly lighted downtown street scenes at night. Brightly lighted nightclub or theater districts at night. Las Vegas or Times Square. Store window displays at night. Neon and other lighted signs at night. Flood lighted buildings, fountains, monuments, Christmas lighting, trees, indoor and outdoor. Fairs, amusement parks at night, night football, baseball, race tracks. A day for anything that will last in, I feel cut off, need to see noon, no one, being a woman can't make a campaign of it, instincts not to, but forced to be only with other women for a while, a good idea, some self that isn't full of, and quiet, other thing bring how out spring cold harbor, and then a full out of out of metaphor junk, image, new mind, rewind, will hit, under the tree, did, where, porter, a porter, a good beer, where were the men, were we brought up without them, you set up your life so you can run it, I can't and support myself, but some of the time do. Why the rest, and will this ending change it? Must be, must be a way, and man not know this is Eddie's car. You have a place. When you need me, call me. When I get back, I think, I'll take a few days off. Hope nobody comes up. My eyes fire, bathroom doubles. That's Jacques and Kathleen's window in their tree. That's great. Did you do that on purpose? These are all double exposures. On purpose? A whole roll. Really? Yeah. That's quite a day you had. Quite a day. Is that a double exposure? Some of them are triple, I think. That's my idea of a house. Of what? Of a house. Jesus. What was that? A little lens tissue in the fan. That's a beautiful camera, isn't it? Beautiful what? Camera. I mean that... I just, I don't know, I really like, I mean, aside from the double exposures, I really like the way that camera frames, and, you know, something very clean looking about all the, yeah, they really, what's this, a grocery store? Yeah, I, th I think that's a single exposure, it's really strange, isn't it? Isn't that the day, uh, what's his name came up, Bill Lieberman? No, somebody else had the same exact car, worked at the theater, a guy from West Virginia, a house in the sky, huh, that's great, camera Bernadette? No, that's great. You were walking upside down? Is that you in the sky? That's my notebook in the sky. Okay, huh, that's great. Come you look so sad, huh? My body has taken over, though. I know, hmm. Who do you see first, replaced by Ed? Ed's head and your body, just because Ed, Ed's exposure is a little bit higher. Well, the first thing that catches your eye, sort of, is that very light area on the left-hand side of Ed's eye. That's two different areas of sky, huh? God, what's that? 
God, a wrathful, angry God. He doesn't look so wrathful. He looks like a, looks really strange. Great hair, though. Imagine if you had hair like that. Who God? Anybody. I don't remember that day at all. These pictures I can't remember. It's fire, the fire crossing the stove. Look at this. Inside the prison grounds, convicts, that there will be no administrative reprisals for the riots, took command of four of the five cell blocks of the prison. Wow, where? Was a model of security, Attica, New York, and saws, drills, WNBC TV. Do I need music? I bought a half a gallon of wine to complete the second diary. Shorter than life, James Mason and Marta Torin in. He's a doctor who's stolen a lot of money. They fall in love, but he's loved before and been broken. They wind up in the lazy town in, in Mexico. She convinces him to stay, but finally they must go back to settle with the mob. They do and plan to return to Mexico for a life. It's all set. He crosses the street to phone the airport and gets killed by a car. It was no one's fault, she says. Life magazine brought this on, but the house is a tree. Do I still figure in your life? The windows come together, but brighter, and the rush of light is for the giant plant. All right, everybody. Going to go ahead and get started soon. If you want to find a seat, get comfortable. There's still some seats available in the main space, and plenty of room around the edges. We're settling in, we're getting ready. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. My name is Laura Henriksen. I'm the <laughs> I am so honored and delighted and just so grateful to be here with you all this evening to honor and celebrate the great poet and friend and teacher Bernadette Mayer on the occasion of her 78th birthday. Happy birthday, Bernadette. Before we get into tonight's program, I'd like to take a moment to extend our gratitude to Phil Good, Marie Warsh, Max Warsh, and Sophia Warsh. Yeah. I'm thanking them for all of their work and care in joining my collaborator and co-host Kay Gabriel and I in organizing this gathering. I'd also like to say a big thank you to longtime friend of the project and admirer of Bernadette, Susan Mills, who made the beautiful blue guest book, which includes handmade paper of upstate, mil upstate milkweed that's at the front of the space. And if you haven't yet signed it this evening, please be sure to find a moment to do so before you slip away. And then I'd like to thank you all for being here, for demonstrating with the abundance of your presence something that I think is particularly crucial and true about Bernadette's work. As Kay writes in her beautiful introduction to the new issue of the newsletter, which is dedicated to Bernadette, quote, Mayer's work is committed to the universalist premise that anyone with any relationship to thought and language is or could be a writer. Unquote. In her writing, teaching, living, Bernadette made an invitation to poetry and poetic experimentation that is so expansive and capacious, so irresistible, that it can make anyone feel welcome to participate, welcome to record their days and write their poems, welcome to be transformed and transformative. As she put it, give everybody everything. We see this material and psychic commitment to generosity everywhere in Bernadette's work. We see it in the publication page to Utopia, requesting endless free circulation. 
We see it in memory, presented earlier this evening, which invites viewers not just to be artists and writers alongside her, but to be her, to share for a time her consciousness. We see it in her Mimeo argument from the Poetry Project newsletter, a copy of which hangs in our office right upstairs, as an everyday reminder that our work here is to give poetry away with free and unfailing abandon. It feels particularly meaningful to host this celebration at the Poetry Project, where Bernadette worked as the director from 1980 to 1984, and we, where she, for decades before and after that, read published and taught what surely must have been hundreds of poets, many of whom would go on to teach many more poets, sharing Bernadette's books and experiments literally across generations. Her influence permeates this place in the most necessary and daily of ways, in our social and political practices, in the way we organize our structure around the radical possibilities of poetic community, and our dedication to relating to language in a way that is transgressive, playful, rigorous, and liberatory. I will say, just for myself, both in my writing and in my participation in this community, not infrequently do I pause to have this precise thought, what would Bernadette Mayer do? And then I try to do it. <laughs> Last night, someone asked me what it means to me to be a poet, and I thought, of course, of Bernadette. I thought about how she teaches us not only that everyone can be and is a poet, but also that a poet can be and is anyone and anything. In her epigrams, for example, she speaks as a humpback whale, an uncaught house mouse, a six pack of Coke, a variety pack of donuts, an elk, a garden, a hidden owl, a cockroach, a cup of coffee, and a pen in your lover's hand. This visionary capacity to not only share her consciousness, but also to transport it into the world around her, offers an instructive foundation for thinking about the complexity of being or having a self, and the liberatory reality of always exceeding those limits. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for receiving Bernadette's invitation. We'll begin now with an archival recording from 1978. This is called Eve of Easter. Milton, who made his illiterate daughters read to him in five languages, till they heard the news he would marry again and said they'd rather hear he was dead. Milton, who turns even Paradise Lost into an autobiography, I have three babies tonight, all three are sleeping. Rachel, the great-great-great-granddaughter of Herman Melville, is asleep on the bed. Sophia and Marie are sleeping. Sophia, namesake of the wives of Louis Friedson, the scholar, and Nathaniel Hawthorne. Marie, my mother's oldest name, these three girls resting in the dark, I made the lucent dark. I stole images from Milton to cure opacous gloom, to render the room an orb beneath this raucous moon of March, eclipsed only in daylight, heavy breathing baby bodies, daughters and descendants in the presence of the great ones, Milton and Melville and Hawthorne, everyone is speaking at once. I only looked at them, all blended, each half Semitic, of a race always at war. The rest of their inherited grace from among Nordics, Germans and English, Writers at peace, rushing warring Jews into democracy when actually peace is at the window begging entrance with the hordes in the midst of air too cold for this time of year. Eve of Easter and the shocking resurrection idea. Someone baby stirs now, hungry for an egg. It's the Melville baby going to make a fuss. The Melville one sucking her fingers for solace. She makes a squealing noise, Hawthorne baby still deeply asleep the one like my mother, out like a light. The Melville one, though, the smallest, wants the most because she doesn't really live here. Hawthorne will want to be nursed when she gets up. Melville sucked a bit and dozed back off. Now Hawthorne is moving around. She's the most hungry, yet perhaps the most seduced by darkness in the room. I can hear Hawthorne. I know she's awake now, but will she stir, disturbing the placid sleep of Melville and insisting on waking us all? Meanwhile, the rest of the people of Lennox drive up and down the street. Now Hawthorne wants to eat. 
They all see the light by which I write. Hawthorne sighs. The house is quiet. I hear Melville's toy. I've never changed the diaper of a boy. I think I'll go get Hawthorne and nurse her for the pleasure of cutting through the darkness before the noise of measure stimulates the boys. I'll cook a fish, retain poise in the presence of heady descendants. Stone will their fathers look at me and drink ink. I return a look to all the daughters and I wink. Eve of Easter, I've inherited this peaceful sleep of the children of men. Rachel, Sophia, Marie, and again me, Bernadette, all heart I live, all head, all eye, all ear. I lost the prejudice of paradise and wound up caring for the babies of these guys. Good evening. Uh, I'm Kay Gabriel, and like Laura, thank you for being here. Uh, like Laura, I work at the project. Um, to talk about Bernadette, I could deliver a list of superlatives as long as my body, but I don't need to. The readers will do that. Uh, all I need to tell you is that Bernadette Mayer's writing changed my life. And what an honor to celebrate her here, standing in the sanctuary where, as director, she welcomed audiences to the Poetry Project, where she herself read countless times, in this place that, in fact, would not be what it is without her, among people who wouldn't be the readers and writers we are without her, or indeed the friends and lovers we are, using and changing the language that she did, in fact, change. Tonight, we are all her students, her collaborators, her co-conspirators. Voices in the sanctuary, I don't have to tell you guys this, you know. Voices in the sanctuary echo for a long time. And I kind of think that tonight ours will join hers in the secret places here where sound doesn't die, it just changes. I want to echo Laura as well and um, mention the issue of the, the newsletter um, that's sitting on your chairs um, with a cover that Max designed. Thank you, Max. Um, it's a special issue dedicated to essays about Bernadette and poems after her that follow her list of writing experiments. It's very moving. It's really, really smart. It's a giant leap forward for Bernadette, for Bernadette studies. There's like five or ten dissertations and millions of poetry books embryonically present in its many suggestions and insights. So please do take one home. If you get it delivered and you feel like, oh, I don't need it, take it anyway. And in Bernadette's spirit, give it to a friend. I also want to say a special thanks to uh, uh, Caroline Shadud and Soursop Flower Farm, who, um, for ver uh, who uh, assembled the astonishing floral design today uh, in celebration of Bernadette's life and her birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday, Bernadette. In Utopia, she wrote, together we will put things on paper that have never been there. And tonight, I believe that ardently. Our first reader tonight is Philip Good. I'm going to read a collaboration I wrote with Burnett decades ago on a uh, baby blue Smith Corona electric typewriter, Skylands. The trill over Swan Pond, something trilled. I don't know what it was. The sky changed only in clouds. Eglatine moths massed at the Monroe lights as not yet said moon grew large and Shiva danced again with Guan Yin. Wood not only flows, but brings life to seven big turtles sunning on a stone, large as insects might smile at you. Or the nearsighted giant leeches wading to the sea again, or the correct water for lobsters and beautiful green octopi to isolate the vision 
Behold, for not all humans, that sight of the hawk swarming from an actual road. Let's thank the frogs for the advent of spring. No walls, no glass or ash or belonging towards speed and bringing the dearer belonging presence of the tunge of flowers. For dinner, dare we eat a violet or a clover fellow flower? Shellfish seem welcome in the friendly air and time. There is an animal in there that smiles with a thought that proceeds language, so don't say ouch at a thorn. Color of bark talk before flowers appear in view, the reds next to pale greens of springs, whites, and violets, the sight of early skunk cabbage, and that purple marsh thing, great plant land zone, hideous preference of the new for housing. And one ant climbs the floor in no direction but forward, because she is Marianne Moore, and also the moth, who is so many monsters gone into ice elevators. Star Trekish moss will rake your leaves for you if you aren't too off planet, living in a black shoe made by cold fish where one person's parent died because of lack of giant spider in the heating system. f Moscow mansions with ghoulish joyness, hawks are large, man. You should see them, they're archaic, to smile on souls finding fresh blood still warm in the sun, and spirit lovers, conversers looking for the trillings of reason lines. Of course you know that, and then, there were the blue viburnum and how we felt at home, not found in the studio collecting dust on sofa and window, unopened to air of crow flight, or a flight of the most stupendous yet hated blue jay, hooray, jumping under the almost happy spring song plants with thought, without language, with color, the irrehensible nasty blue jay telling us their song without remorse. Then the sound close to the feet is countless among these when the ant is near, fearing our sleeping as you smoke between gone trucks brought into night songs, songs of fame and everlasting glory. Just play the lion in yoga and run till the ostrich appears. It's love in an overdue sign along plain view as the duck smiles with the trill of a sound never heard. And there is the memory of the heron and of all the stuff we've ever known together, especially hawks. Not even to climb said mountain along daybreak. Is it daybreak now or will it be tomorrow outdoors? Those small shoes welcome kind words to breathe in, behind thin glass wings kept on going to next equinox or something equally glorious to celebrate, reviewing in window of broken ice talk as high as the condensed water flow. And now, friend, our stuff equals something as high as the condensed water flow and actually as great as any American translate. Happy birthday, Bernadette, we love you. Yes, you did change the world. And look what you've done. Look at all these wonderful people gathered here together and all the participants, bless you. Thank you so much, Phil. That was just astonishing. I like forgot I was hosting. I was so transported. We'll be over in this corner now. Um, I also wanted to say uh, an enormous thank you to Jonathan Aprea, who's with us this evening taking photographs. Thank you so much, Jonathan. <laughs> and I'm really honored to turn it over now to Marie Warsh. Hi everyone, I just want to start off by thanking the Poetry Project, Laura and Kay and Kyle and everyone here 
for organizing this celebration. People keep asking me if I'm stressed out and busy organizing the memorial, and I have to say it's really been them putting this all together, and certainly with our feedback, but it's been fantastic how much you guys have done and how beautiful these flowers are. Um, it's really just so wonderful to be here with all of you on Bernadette's birthday, and it really feels like a culmination of the past couple of years that have been really so filled with love and support for Bernadette and also for me and the rest of the family. I feel really lucky to be a part of this community. I'm gonna read two excerpts from Midwinter Day, sort of as a form of introduction and welcome. I'm gonna read the end of the first section of Midwinter Day. And this poem is about a lot of things, as we know, um, but it is very much about love and specifically familial love. And reflecting on that, I just wanted to acknowledge my father, Louis, who we celebrated here in the same space just over a year ago. And you know, he's really the you in a lot of Midwinter Day, and it's always a really special part of it for me. Um, and then the second excerpt I'm gonna read is my mother's account of a tantrum that I had <laughs> in the Lennox Library, which I feel like I'm now a little bit famous for reading over the past several years at the various marathons. And I'm reading it in part because it always made Bernadette laugh. So I'm reading it in part to, to conjure that laugh. This morning, I have both a heart exchanging a guilty love for everyone. For love is the same, and you? What is your substance, and whereof are you made? that millions of strange shadows on you tend. Since everyone has every one, one shade, and you but one, can every shadow lend? There's something I want to say. I don't know how to put it. Brightest sun that dies today lives again as blithe tomorrow. But if we dark suns of sorrow set, oh then, how long a night shuts the eyes of our short light. Don't take what I say too seriously or too lightly. I'm sorry, never mind. I was just playing around. <laughs> I'm trying to find what I guess I'd rather not know consciously. I'd like to know what kind of person I must be to be a poet. I seem to wish to be you. Love is the same and does not keep that name. I keep that name, and I am not the same. You, Shakespeare, Edwin Denby, and others, Catullus, I've nothing to say. The anonymous blue sky is gray. I love your being in my unresisting picture. All love seen, all said is dented love saluted image. In the ending morning, nothing said is mean. Perhaps it's too long. I'm only learning, along with love's warning, to invent a song. Then, for the breath of words, respect me for my dumb thoughts speaking in effect. This was my dream, now it is done. So this is the second, uh, third part. Often memory lends images to looking past the town, close to the trees, into the forest I saw while rehearsing for this narration. It's a piece or a dream or a story or book, exciting invention. We cross the street getting a line for the poem from right of way. But the neat dry bank is always the same big loss even today, though the pigeons from our roof feed in the yard next door we are still as poor. A little courtesy won't kill you, it says on the Commonwealth of Massachusetts 1978 car inspection sticker. <laughs> Lock it, pocket the key. In winter, you can see into the library yard from the street. Three little kittens, and there's a walk it in my pocket are overdue. We go in. There's a sign on the door that from the first of the year, library hours will be curtailed due to fuel prices. 
I feel the library should be colder and open longer hours. But I'd rather see the downfall of the Shah. Everybody's autobiography is in this library. There's Noah's Ark. I go down the narrow Victorian hall to find alone and alive. Two ladies talk of Bible classes. The man who tends the yard goes out by the locked gate. The loud noon siren sounds from the town hall. The library clock chimes 12 times. We borrow Pepe's diary and Drinkwater's book on Pepe's. Bit between my teeth by Edmund Wilson, Alone, The Little Lamb, and Curious George. Tantara! It's a sound echoic of the trumpet's blast. Marie Maria Callas is having a tantrum in the library. <laughs> she won't surrender her books. She won't put on her coat. It's a violent, willful outburst of rage and annoyance, like not having a room of one's own or the love of another. It's a fit of bad temper caused by the extremes of temperature. Nothing is mixed properly in her. She is excessive, rude, full of drama, intense fits of pitched proportion, freaking out. She is hard and soft at once, hot and suddenly cold, mad. She needs water. She needs kneading. She is not at all proportionate to the energy expended. <laughs> How resilient is she? Her frame of mind is readily angered and enraged. She has a temper. It's a bad temper. She's really mad. Her disposition is bad. Her humor is excitable, volatile. Her temperament is choleric, hence she indulges excessively in this fantastic outburst of kicking and resisting, in which the pitch of the tones of her loudest screams is like an electrically driven car to the consistent sun's hottest spots. <laughs> She is fiery and dark, nothing tempers it. It's her nature, she is bored, she's magnetic. Her elbows won't bend into the sleeves of the dumb coat. She has the strength of a thousand women and men, opposites. The veins in her neck bulge with rage, <laughs> rapid and combust. She is exhausted, forced into the coat because of the cold. She begs kisses and loves collaboration with some remorse. The best thing is to take her away fast, make the change. She looks a mess from her bout with what's intense and what's not. She flies into a charming contrariness which totally belies that for her down was up and water milk. Breath unallowed and language the false start to love it is, how unknown it is, leaping and flying into the cold we breathe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marie. Our next reader is Fanny Howe. Just begin. <laughs> well, this poem was written in um, the 70s, I believe, if not a little later than that. It's called The Way to Keep Going in Antarctica. Be strong, Bernadette. Nobody will ever know I came here for a reason. Perhaps there is life here of not being afraid of your own heart beating. Do not be afraid of your own heart beating. Look at the very small things with your eyes and stay warm. Nothing outside can cure you, but everything's outside. 
There is great shame for the world in knowing you may have gone this far. Perhaps this is why you love the presence of other people so much. Perhaps this is why you wait so impatiently. You have nothing more to teach until there is no more panic at the knowledge of your own real existence. And then only special childish laughter to be shown. And no more lies, no more, not to find you, no more coming back and more returning. Southern journey, small things, and not my own debris, something to fight against. And we are all very fluent about ourselves, our own ideas of food, a wild sauce. There's not, not much point in its being over, but we do not speak them. I had written the man who sewed his soles back on his feet. And then I panicked most at the sound of what the wind could do to me if I crawled back to the house. Two feet give no position. If the branches cracked over my head and then they're threatening me if I covered my face with beer and sweated till you returned. If I suffered, what else could I do? Is this, thank you. Thank you so much, Fanny. That was beautiful. I'm so honored to turn it over now to Charlotte Carter. Thanks. I, I, I'm not going to read anything of Bernadette's, and God knows I wouldn't dare try, <laughs> try to read anything of mine. Uh, but um, I, first of all, one of the most useful things that she ever said to me was, um, if you're uh, scared when you're giving a reading, put your hand on your hip. <laughs> So, should keep it there. <laughs> um, anyway, I, it's really, what I have to say about Bernadette is really strictly about her generosity to me as a person and how I, uh, I think this 1971, I got to New York and I really did not have friends. And, and someone, uh, someone heard me say I wanted to take a writing class. So um, he, he said there, you know, I think they, they, they do that at that church across the street. <laughs> so um, I, I was um, stunned to find that, you know, this was, I was living across the street from well, the Valhalla of the New York School, the titans of the New York School were coming in and out of <laughs> here all the time. Anyway, um, I, I didn't know what the heck I was doing trying to write, but I was trying anyway. And uh, in our workshop, uh, you know, Bernadette was assigning to us the usual panoply of uh, wealth stuff. You know, you write in the dark, try writing in the dark, keep a journal, write off someone else's work, write while you're at the movies, etc. And I, I did it. I utterly taken by her and I came out convinced, uh, I, well, number one, she knew everything. She just seemed to know everything. The first time I went into the workshop, she was talking about Wittgenstein. And I thought, oh, okay, I'm, I'm a moron. I don't get this. Anyway, um, as we started to be personal friends, 
uh, I would laugh sometimes because I think um, sh she must have had some cultural assumptions about me and vice versa. And uh, the first time she came to my apartment, uh, I asked, asked her to come over for dinner. So I put on the table this honking uh, pork roast. And she said, oh, I, I, I'm surprised. I thought it was going to be brown rice. So um, <laughs> I could, you know, sort of read. She was thinking ex-hippie bourgeois, right? <laughs> so I said, but I didn't say at the time. I waited for many years to say that what was going through my mind was, um, you're a, you're an icon, you're a downtown icon, you're someone who's a, a, a cultural force in, in New York and you really ought to have a better black dress. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> anyway, there, there was this one sort of el elder person who was, uh, you know, in, in the, I guess, in the Pantheon, and um, she was, it was her job to be mean to me. <laughs> she said once, you know, the stuff you write is okay, it's, it's nice, but uh, it's really, you know, all about Bernadette. She's the genius, she's, re she's rewriting the English language. And I said I couldn't agree more, bitch. <laughs> I, uh, as I said, I, I, I was convinced that Bernadette knew everything and could do, ev could do anything. And she, when I was ill, um, approached someone in the, at the National Arts and Letters, some kind of outfit like that. Um, I, I was ill, really ill, and they not only paid my hospital bills, but they paid for my doctor. Uh, and after that, she sort of hooked me up with a job for, uh, we were all posing for painters who like to, like to paint people who look <laughs> weird. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> um, not long after that, I remember being sad because um, my very sweet, unlucky brother, my younger brother, um, got married and he and his wife were having a baby. And I, you know, I think it's pretty well understood at this, this point the worst thing you could be in Chicago is a black boy. And I was crying because um, I said I couldn't save him. So Bernadette said, get him, try to adopt him, and I will help you raise him. And I, I began to laugh. I said, oh yeah, of course, you know, Miss Whiskey and Beer, you're gonna help me raise a child, right? Well, of course, as usual, I was wrong, she was right, because a few years later, she had not one, but three exemplary children. And uh, I, I mean, could go on forever, I'm gonna wrap this up. Um, uh, I, I don't know, I, I, I don't think I could write a sonnet if my life depended on it, but I did take from her and all the other great poets that I encountered a different way to listen, things to do with words, etc. And uh, there are little things that one hears all the time. I put and I put them away, thinking that's going to be interesting to work with. So the other day, I heard this weird phrase on a program, the murmuration of starlings. And I thought, gee, I'll have to look that up, find, find out what that's all about. 
and it occurred to me at the same moment that you know Bernadette would be all over that as soon as she heard it. And um, I also thought of visiting them in Lenox once. And as Bernadette, Lewis, and the children and I were leaving, we were going to walk in the woods, have a picnic or whatever, but we were carrying blankets. Just as we're in the doorway, <laughs> she says to me, oh, Charlotte, you're not afraid of snakes, are you? <laughs> and uh, I thought, keep in mind, I had moved from the apartment across the street because I saw a mouse. But I said, no, no, I'm, I'm not afraid of, I'm not afraid of, I'm not afraid of snakes because I know they're afraid of you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Charlotte. Our next reader is Barbara Epler. Um, hi. Um, I want to say on behalf of all my colleagues at New Direction that we all love Bernadette very much. And um, we were so happy that we managed to get out her eighth book, Milkweed Smithereens, when she was still here to get it. And, um, and we were very proud it was a finalist. It was a National Book Award and NBCC finalist. So that made us happy too. And, um, I'm gonna read her, her poem essay, but first I wanted to share um, some of Bernadette's postscripts. I was going through about 30 years of letters and um, I already really miss getting her mail. Um, okay, these are from Bernadette. P.S. I am enclosing bee balm. P.S. I broke my arm while shielding my scarlet tanager from this wood stove I was falling on sober. And that one was signed Pope Bernadette. P.S. There's a luncheonette in Troy that used to be called the hairy arm. Informally, because a guy with a hairy arm would line up on it the mini hot dogs they sold there and stick it out the window for customers. <laughs> Formally, it's called Famous Lunch. They have a testimonial from Hillary Clinton. P.S. Is everything okay? P.S. We had our harvest feast yesterday, but it was meager, bad year for growing things, and unhappy. Phil got a speeding ticket returning to his temp job keeping track of the sales of bras. P, P S, there's a G cup. <laughs> P, P, P S, do you wear a bra? P S, I type in Norwegian now. P S, let's go out for oysters. So this is essay. I guess it's too late to live on the farm. I guess it's too late to move to a farm. I guess it's too late to start farming. I guess it's too late to begin farming. I guess we'll never have a farm. I guess we're too old to do farming. I guess we couldn't afford to buy a farm anyway. I guess we're not suited to being farmers. I guess we'll never have a farm now. I guess farming is not in the cards now. I guess Lewis wouldn't make a good farmer. I, can't ex I guess I can't expect we'll ever have a farm now. I guess I'll have to give up all my dreams of being a farmer. I guess I'll never be a farmer now. We couldn't get a farm anyway, though Allen Ginsberg got one late in life. Maybe someday I'll have a big garden. I guess farming is really out, feeding the pigs and the chickens walking between miles of rows of crops. I guess farming is just too difficult. We'll never have a farm. Too much work and still to be poets. Who are the farmer poets? Was there ever a poet who had a self-sufficient farm? 
Flannery O'Connor raised peacocks. Wendell Berry has a farm. Faulkner may have farmed a little. And Robert Frost had farmland. And someone told me Samuel Beckett farmed. Very few poets are real farmers. If William Carlos Williams could be a doctor, and Charlie Vermont too, why not a poet who is also a farmer? Of course, there was Brook Farm, and Virgil raised bees. Perhaps some poets of the past were overseers of farmers. I guess poets tend to live more momentarily than life on a farm would allow. You could never leave the farm to give a reading or go to a lecture by Emerson in Concord. I don't want to be a farmer, but my mother was right. I should never have tried to rise out of the proletariat. Unless I could convince myself, as Satan argues with Eve, that we are among a proletariat of poets of all the classes, each ill-paid and surviving on nothing, or on as little as one needs to survive, steadfast as any farmer and fixed as the stars, tenants of a vision we rent out endlessly. Thank you so much, Barbara. That was so beautiful. Thank you. Up next is Alyssa Gorelick. Alyssa, whenever you're ready. I was a bit worried this would be too high. That's okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to read a poem from Scarlett Tanninger called Tomorrow. Uh, this poem is from a time before Max and I had our daughters, Zola and Vera. Um, we used to spend a lot of time with Phil and Bernadette, um, kind of meandering and exploring all of the attractions in the East Nassau area and speculating about them and talking about doing so. And on the top here it says, for Max and Alyssa, and under that it says, Mally Sachs War Elish, which uh, is a mashup of Alyssa Max. Gorelick, which is a variation on what we often got in the mail, which was to Max and Alyssa Warshelik, which we agreed sounded better than Warshelik. So this is called Tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll see the light bulb in Schenectady. Go to Gem Farms, Gem's Farms in Skodak, then on to Howe Caverns, then to see the Wayne Tebow show at the Clark, where we'll stop to notice the melting ice sculpture. Then, excellent spinach sap soup at the restaurant in Williamstown, a brief stop at the Octagonal Museum, on to Northampton to see Smith College Art Museum and Greenhouse, where we'll see a green heron. It'd be nice to be able to walk today so we could go to Opus 40 in Socrates, followed by dinner of oysters and mussels at the Bear. Then on to check out the sheep at the Sheep Herding Inn, where we're able to buy ricotta cheese, which means twice baked, with which we'll make a pizza with fresh figs gotten from the berry farm. War, what is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Thank you so much, Alyssa. Our next reader is Grace Murphy. I was told from my old eyes that I had to bring a flashlight. So I did. Um, I'm going to read one of the many hundreds of poems that Bernadette wrote for me. Um, <laughs> all of them pretty wonderful. This one is called On Gifts for Grace. I saw a great teapot. I wanted to get you this stupendous 100% royal blue and black uh, check shirt. There was a red and black striped one, too. Then I saw these boots at a place called Chuckles. 
They laced up to about two inches above your ankles, all leather and in red, black, or purple. It was hard to have no money today. I won't even speak about the possible flowers or, and kinds of lingerie, all linen and silk, and not yet perfumed laces, brilliant enough for any of the graces, full of luxury, grace notes, prosperousness, and charm. But I can only praise you with this poem, it being the same as the meaning of your name. I had wanted to read a poem Bernadette wrote when my father died, but I couldn't find it anywhere. Um, I remembered that it began when we were children growing up in Brooklyn, and it ended um, in a way that is a perfect ending for the celebration of Bernadette in poetry. Bananas, fiddlesticks, I love you. Thank you so much, Grace. We'll hear now from Bob Holman. Oh boy, I don't know what to say. Um, you know, we worked right over there for many a moon and many a sun, all of which were uh, in Bernadette's domain. Uh, we even had the audacity once to close for the summer, um, at which point <laughs> poets continued to write their poems. Um, I remember when she told me that I had to interrupt her workshop um, and in utter anger, tell her that she could not end our affair in this manner. <laughs> and after I left, she told the workshop, write down what you just saw. <laughs> um, I was uh, in love with Utopia. And so I wrote, uh, I put together the index for it. It just seemed to me that the language was so crucial. <laughs> I mean, it's language. And then there are the words, and then there are how they're put together. And Bernadette was the master of all that. So I thought, let's take them all apart and uh, see how they stack up. So here's a poem for her first, Bernadette. The cloud has settled in your nose again. It's a festival of activism to get down below the border where the detention centers host poetry workshops. It's a challenge. It's the job. It's what we do. Every day on our walk, the foxes, <laughs> something, what do they do? Oh. Every day on our walk, the foxes bless you. So let's do F into G. Famous being, page five. Famous myth of being, five. Farce, 134. Farts, 118. Father, 623, 63, 81, 122, 134. Fatisha, 134. Favorite, bowing, 62. Feet, brown feet, do they turn you on? Eight. Feet ache, 134. Falafel, 132. Fight with lover, what to say? Six. Fighting, weird replacement for love, 62. Filamentous magic carpets, 89 following. Fire department, 89. First master of reproduction, 124. Fish emulsion, 70. 
Fish, 132. Fish that looks like a bishop, 125. Fishkill, the future begins just outside, 131. Fisk, John, 64. Five dollars, a room full of five dollars, five. Flagstaff, 83. Flirtatious, lessons in, 136. Flour and water flavored with vanilla, 117. Flour, 139. Flour of reform, 116. Luxurious wild flour, 117. Flying, how to do it, 24. Flying machines, 89. Real and phony flying, diagram, 137. Techniques of flying, 22. Fool, 8, 85, 115. Customary and recurrent fool, 114 to 115. Country of fools, 120. Fooling around, 137. Fucking fools, 118. Forgetful fools, 116. Forget how Earth got populated, page six. 45 minutes, exactly, 138. Foster, Ed, call, 71. Four states plus one more of H.G. Wells, 120. Fourier, Charles, 155. France, 33, Francis, 32, 69, Ben Franklin, 8, Freedom, 60, Old French, 103, Freud, Sigmund, 155, Frick, The, on 5th, 29, Friended, 6, 23, 135, 139, 145, Friends, almost as intimate as lovers, 7, Caress your best, six. Strong friend, 32. From utopia to nightmare, Walsh, 130. Fuck, five. Fuck everybody, six. Fuck like animals, 82. Fuck somebody in the house, 122. Fuck the lesbian, 120. Fucked up dinner, fucking all the time. Fucking boor, Plato, 119. Fucking fools, 118. Fucking moon, 135. Fucking selves, 62. Fuller, Buckminster, 59, 155. Fuller, Margaret, 116 and following. Gajia, 103. Gajinga Guelaputa Ragerd Frent. Diagram, decimals, and etymology, page 103. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bob. Um, we're now going to watch a video contribution uh, from uh, Bill Denwile. Bill Denwiles? Bill Denwiles, excuse me. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, Bill Denwiles here. Hello, Marie, Sophie, Max, Phil. Um, we're here to celebrate Bernadette. Bernadette Mayer was an extraordinary poet uh, and human being. Bernadette was a poet, she was a mother, she was a visionary, and she was a cultural revolutionary who not only changed language, who not only changed poetry, but I tend to believe she changed all of us as well. Bernadette could communicate and talk with ease to almost anybody. Uh, a stranger on Second Avenue, my own mother, uh, her neighbors, who she spent so much time with in later years in East Nassau. They all spoke very highly of Bernadette um, and her ability to be able to talk about absolutely anything. And that's what I also remember her about as well. Um, the most extraordinary thing to ever happen to me at the Poetry Project has to do indeed with Bernadette. Um, Phil and I were making ready our magazine, Blue Smoke, and we still had not yet received anything from Bernadette. So one Wednesday night in late winter, early spring 1984, in the vestibule of the parish hall, uh, the Poetry Project, as Bernadette was manning one of the tables, I sort of hesitatingly asked her if she had something for Blue Smoke, whereupon she went, reached into the back pocket of her jeans, 
and produced a neatly folded packet of goldenrod papers, reeking quite heavily of patchouli, and handed them to me and said, there. Uh, I stuck it in my back pocket, and I don't think I looked at it till I got home later that night in North Jersey. Uh, that poem was eating the color off a lineup of words, um, and it's an amazing poem in that it includes everything from excavation, the excavation going on in front of 172 East 4th Street, where Bernadette was living with her family, um, to overcooked potatoes, overcooked carrots, apples, essential oils, and the clincher here is Anubis is one of Santa's reindeer. And the poem itself goes something like this in form. And it's not to be missed, so if you can sort of contact someone who may have a copy of Blue Smoke One and look at that, I highly recommend it. Tonight I'm going to be reading two things. I'm going to be reading Bernadette's hit single from the Giorno Poetry Systems album called the Dial of Poem Poets from 1970-71, and it's a piece from her book, Moving. These stories about after the revolution are sad, the construction workers thought. There's no way to read them. I have it all in my mind, though, too, said his friend, another construction worker from the past. We made a mistake. There's no getting around it. He sat down and fed a few ideas to his companions. Like a speech, we started out thinking we could clear things up. We had never heard of Buckminster Fuller or any of his friends. We were ignorant, but not shy. We were paid to fight, so we did it. We had a good time then, or at least we thought so. I didn't know what I was doing. One night I went home and my wife said to me, maybe you're doing the wrong thing. After all, we risk everything every day. We don't play at life like they do. Maybe there is some reason for it. By that time, I was tired and fed up with being ordered around by the CIA. I wanted money, but it was all wrong. So I took a vacation with the whole family. They thought I had run away. They blew up my car with my wife and children in it. I knew then that the government was corrupt. <laughs> that we had to have a revolution and all those people I had been fighting were now my friends. So I went to see one of them. I had been watching him on and off. I knew him. I knew who he was. When I knocked down his door, I heard a few voices inside. He opened it up and said, everything's blown up, so you might as well come in. Inside, we talked all night and then went out at dawn to do th the things we talked about. We worked all day and all the next day. Then the headlines read, the war is over, but we didn't know who won it. That was all the way across the daily news. So we looked around and said, maybe we won but we couldn't find any of our old friends and gradually things went slowly. We met people, put a few things together and now we live in a big house. We have fresh water and we eat chickpeas, milk and, and instant breakfast as long as they last. Would you care to join us? The government is still indeed corrupt. Holding the Thought of Love from Bill Denoyes. This is a sonnet Bernadette wrote. And to render harmless a bomb or the like of such a pouring in different directions of love. Love scattered, not concentrated, love talked about. So let's not talk of love, the diffuseness of which, round our heads, that aureole song, like on the platforms of the subways and at their stations, is today diffused. As if by the scattering of light rays in a photograph of a softened reflection of a truck in a bakery window. You know I both understand what we found out and I don't. Hiking alone is too complex, like a slap in the face of any joyous appointment, even for the making of money. Abandoning to too large a crack in the unideal sphere of lack of summer when it's winter, of wisdom in the astronomical arts, we, as A and B, separated, then conjoined to see the sights of Avenue C. Thank you for having me, everybody. Catch you on the rebound. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Bye-bye. Good to have Bill with us in that way, and I'm so pleased to turn it over now to Lainey Brown. I'm so happy to be here in this room filled with love for Bernadette, and I just want to send special extra love to all of Bernadette's family.
Bernadette, I miss you. I love you. This space for me has always been so much about you. And not just this space, but every space. And this is a space where so many poets are born. It's a space where I was born. I know you're here, and here are some words for you and for all of us from a letter that you sent to me. The sun of the sea sends blubbering blessings from all sons and daughters, especially in all the colors of the rainbow and the ones that aren't in there yet. By blubbering, I mean blustery or floundering like green pie, key lime, that is sometimes white, piled up so it topples onto the mullet. If you look at it, it is quantum pie. It changes color when it finds your eye upon it. So keep out, free is green. Um, I'm gonna read just a couple short collaborations from this book we wrote together, the complete works of Apis mellifera, and then a tiny, tiny excerpt from Milkwood Smithereens. Co-evolutional fig wasp sonnet. The fig entertains the pollinators throughout the pretty artisanal peephole. Tracheotomus opening at the fig's neck to make sure flowers are free of charge, lay their eggs in the moonlight and watch while they hatch. Flower will burst forth like a bird in a Disney-ish way. Therefore, this arrangement is called Socialism. <laughs> the fig has fun entertaining them. Suddenly they become diaphanous and change colors and the male dies, the female escapes, and the fig is eaten on a pizza, than which no pizza could be finer. Living in tents of farinaceous grain, this year I've pitched a polenta tent. The tent poles reinforced artichoke spaghetti. I eat oatmeal, then run barefoot down to the widened kinderhook to see the blue heron will answer my whistle. It's raining so hard my poncho doesn't adequately protect me. So like a whiz kid, I visualize then drink the iced coffee creek where in the wink of an eye, I drown Rising from the dead, I join everyone else who did that, and we sing, Dear fucking sun, I aim to shine on all sentient beings like you, except those who own private property. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, Milkwood Smithereens, the lobelias of fear. There are maple trees, one, two, three, but wait, there's five more, two behind the bungalow, and lots in the poetry state forest. I hear target practice from far away. It's probably for shooting deer, bears, and dinosaurs, but how will we, still alive, socialize in the winter, wrapped in bearskins? We'll sit around pot-bellied stoves, eating the lobelias of fear left over from desperation, Last summer's woodland sunflowers and bee balm remind us of black cherry eaten in a hurry while the yard grows in the moonlight, shrinking like a salary or a damaged item when we return in the morning for a breakfast of harvest petunias sprinkled with wild marshmallow. On the wild strawberry does every flower mean a fruit? If so, the ones near the well will make more than my annual handful. If I were organized and fastidious, I'd tie a red string to every flower so I'd know and could brag that a naked plant fed me a good dessert. Thanks.
Thank you so much, Lainey. Um, uh, before I bring up our next performer, I want to um, uh, remind everyone and, and invite you that uh, we have a guest book that uh, Susan Mills um, uh, custom made for us. It's at the, 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 the um, I guess, back or front of the hall. It's that way. Um, on the left, right in front of the bathroom. Um, uh, and uh, we have a variety of markers and pens and I really want to invite, it's, it's big, it's full, um, uh, I really want to invite people before you go tonight to, to sign it, um, to say something um, loving for Bernadette. We're going to gift it to her family afterwards. Um, our next performer is uh, Erica Don Lyle. Hi, cool. Thanks, y'all. It's so good to be here. Um, I'm going to play some music for you guys, and I need to tell you a little bit about it because you'll enjoy it more. Um, that's my theory, anyway. So sometimes I would be uh, visiting over at uh, Phil and Bernadette's place, and um, Bernadette would be like typing on the back porch and I would be thinking about like um, how important typing was to her. You know, like, I don't know if you, if you guys remember like in the obituary she wrote for Lewis in the uh, Poetry Project newsletter last year or two years ago, she said he could type faster than any man I'd ever met. And um, I know that so much of the project of Bernadette's writing was about this effort to capture pure thought, you know, to like eliminate any intermediary and to, to try to get to this immediacy of her pure thought. And um, I play improvised music, so I was, one time I was thinking about um, the typewriter and the guitar and this idea of channeling what's coming, and I said to her, um, we should jam. You could, play the, you could play the drums on the typewriter and I'll play the guitar. And she said, ha! <laughs> Which I think was, meant that she, we're gonna say meant she was tickled by it. Um, and so what happened after that was that Phil in particular thought this was a good idea and he surreptitiously taped some minutes of Bernadette typing and sent it to me. Um, and so I, uh, and then Phil, a couple of weeks ago, was like, this is what you have to do at the thing. <laughs> we have to finally make the song. So we're going to bring Bernadette's typing into this room tonight, and I'm going to uh, do a little duet with her.
Thank you so much, Erica Don. That was astonishing. Yeah. My son, thank you, Noah. Up next, we have Sarah Stedman. really helpful. Bernadette once told me that actually Patti Smith told her to do that, so I'm going to stick to that tonight. <laughs> um, I've been really lucky to be Bernadette's neighbor um, and have her write about the place that I grew up, so she's written about everything and I really feel like she's everywhere all the time. Um, and she really knows how to enjoy the seasons. So I'm going to read something from Works and Days, June 21st. We had a summer squash. They are yellow. We grew it in Bill and Phil's garden. It's the longest day of the year. Shall we eat? Phil's going to celebrate Molly's birthday. She's 10. I got a rabbit for Zola. She's 10 months. A hot air balloon ride costs $225. The valerian flowers smell sweet like lilies. At the point where our little strip of forest meets the Tassawasa and Kinderhook Creeks, I often see the great blue heron, cormorants, a beaver, and once a snake. If Sarah, other one, <laughs> she has so many stars, who's afraid of snakes is with me, I see more. Halfway is the sycamore that a guest once said was dead. It isn't, but it's leaning. The forest is dark, and many of the trees twist at odd angles, leaning towards the sun, then leaning back for a few years. At the place where I put a chair, I pretend it's my living room and a stream running through it. Once a chipmunk posed at the entrance of a hollow log there, I swear at the bench which doesn't exist anymore. I saw garter snakes hatching, but now that place is owned by someone. There's poison ivy everywhere. Alice, the woman across the road, has a sign, beware of the dog. A few feet later is a shrine to BVM. She's leaving her vast property to the Catholic Church. Next to her is Bill who's sharing his garden with us this year. And she really loves Bill Green. So it's been mentioned tonight, along with the herons. Um, and then I'm going to read the last sonnet in sonnets, The Phenomena of Chaos. Love's not intent today. What did I see? A bank, a store, a pattern of leaves, fallen to the basketball court because rain followed the smoke of 11 states' fires. To exit from the universe, you could believe nothing is checked on. But we don't exactly exist, do we? Otherwise, how could we? Do you love me when the Earth's sun sets on your song on your tongue? This is ridiculous. The universe is no longer uniform. By this we mean the universe not or ain't a standard of nothing loves turning no more. Happy birthday, Bernadette. <laughs> thank, you, thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, our next reader is Don Yorty. It was so nice to see Sarah here tonight. She's a really good cook, really good cook. Um, I met Bernadette here in the parish hall. Um, it's where we met. She was drinking a beer, and I asked her for a sip, and that was that. Um, I'm going to read two short things. The first is a text from Mitch Heifel, who can't be here tonight. And Mitch loves Bernadette. He's read everything. Midwinter Day, he reads Midwinter Day. And Mitch 
sent me a text and I thought I'd, I'd share it. In particular, I am attracted to Bernadette's work in which time was a factor, such as midwinter day, state of mind of hour, memory. In these, Bernadette attempts to trace the mind's activity through language and time, a day, an hour, longer periods of time. We are led into the mind as it tracks its own thoughts, Bernadette's thoughts, which move like a Greek philosopher in vivid grammar across the cognitive sky. Her brilliance and her ferocity have sustained several generations of makers. I was lucky to have known her. Me too. Um, I'm going to read the second thing is from Subatomic Moss, which I first read last June when I, I went up state and uh, Annabelle Lee had just published it and it's a collaboration between Phil and, and Bernadette. Uh, and Bernadette said collaborations are kind of like crapshoots, but this is, is really a wonderful book and everybody should get a copy. I'm serious. Um, I, I was thinking today, be before I, I read, I'd just like to say, uh, Montaigne said something like, you don't know how a person has lived till you know how that person has, has died. And I am here to tell you that Bernadette lived an excellent life. Uh, she died in the autumn. It's a time of harvest. She was surrounded by family and friends. And people she had mentored, students decades old, they were, they were coming out of the woodwork. And it was, it was almost overwhelming, but um, there was so much love. I, I think love, you, you, it can't overwhelm. It's, it's just love. Um, so I'm, I'm going to read some of the penultimate stanzas from uh, Subatomic Moss, and it's from the second poem, Unseasonably Wrong Weather. Okay, who owns the world? It's not that guy I want to play with, and it can't be me. I'm a female. Whoever it is, come to my office after class. What are you doing after the world is over? I'll meet you in the parallel universe where it's spring all the time and we will govern with clean energy. There'll be no Arctic drilling, no cars or smokestacks polluting, no fires or fossil fuels burning. To earth, air, fire and water, we say good morning. How many types of commercial planes are there? All different sizes and classes, private and public. Just say no to the jet class flying around willy-nilly and yes to the quiet azure airspace overhead. The sky predated airplanes as humans predated jet setters, as farms predated supermarkets. Let's leave everything alone for a while. Growing everything needed, what do we have to do again? Make the old new again? Rid the world of the ridiculous, let's coexist with the absurd. Along with it will come free leaks. There is no such thing as progress, but you can take your clothes off. Don't forget to leave your mask on and don't forget to leave your hat on, but it's either too hot or too cold, too dry or too wet, too early or too late. I'm too old and you're too young. Between is a truffle no one can find. Whatever aleatory choice might we have? Is it just the throw of the dice? Shall we try the I Ching? Write a meaningless play instead? Stage an experimental dance? Do the dice go ching when you throw them right? Does the impulse to create a play or a dance itself make meaning? Let's dance and see. Thank you so much, Don. Wow. We'll hear now from Leanne Brown. Woo! 
It's so wonderful to be here in this once in a lifetime gathering of so many Bernadette's friends and family and lovers and students and poets and she's the reason I came to New York to be a poet. I wanted to be a poet more than anything and everything that came along with that. And um, one of the many, many gifts she gave me was the book Sonnets that I got to publish with Tinder Buttons Press. Yeah. The, and I wanted to, every time I read these, I, they're always, I find something new. I mean, that's what poetry does, but it's really good. And this poem, this book, always, I see something new. This is one of my very favorite ones. Clap hands. I'll write you sonnets till you come home from school again. The music of your cave become a stalagmitic presence. Honey, I don't have an electronically regulated discharge tube that can emit extremely rapid, brief, and brilliant flashes of light, such as squinting and twisting around as to disorder. It's nice to divide a sonnet. This way, when you might fuck me up the ass on account of the presence of the bureau by the door, because of some song, like the one by Tom Verlaine, where he says, a do, like a kid from Brooklyn. Tell like so, cause me, Bill, loves you to not to know. Turn the here to why over Bill, me, cause I'll know, I, you, say and am to exist, I, not entranced pretty. Can't Bill with startling say Shakespeare myself that? Couplet, I adore you, it's my habit. I want manly things and should not. Women, come to me. And <laughs> and this is the book that we wrote the first three months of the pandemic. It's called, Oh You Nameless and Unnamed Ridges. The only edit she really gave for the book was I tried to call it anatomical uh, quarant, anat I don't know what I tried to call it. Um, and she's like, no, give it to Imris, my kid, and let them decide the name. So I loved that it has the word ridges in it because she was born in Ridgewood. Um, so I'm going to read one poem by her. Um, we went back and forth. They're poems and letters. Um, it's called At K. Leanne from 414.20. Green grass, yellow sun, black sorrel. Where do the ramps go when they run, run? Is yard of the exultation back eat storm? Outage, power, broken, creasy toe, ivy, red winged, not night, the robin conference, invisible house. I went to my house, but it was invisible. Least times the porch river, I saw you not. There was a river lawn there, like birds, in a sound so far away you couldn't see it flow. A beetle's song, the house details, fluffy room, the river flowed into my room like a sonnet. Sound like a bird in a photograph of infinity of the universe when it's not the earth. Cock, I swore you'd be there, no buds on the trees, 22 mornings, a little sky, Every Edmund Wilson said, you can eat tulips. Nabokov said, rainier, ramp butter is best. In the dooryard, hyacinths brood an elixir, immortellement, a grown-up version of a nest on top of a porch like a river, set up like a sound. Didn't you, he, I, it, she, oh dear, eerie, hungry Bernadette. And I'm going to read one more thing. Um, but the thing about that poem is um, she had remixed some of the words in my, the poem that I sent her. And I didn't even realize that until <laughs> later. I was like, what were you doing? But she, she used my words and then redid them. Um, remix. OK, this is B-Day acrostics for Bernadette that I wrote on, for her on May 12th um, in 2020. And um, we read to her. Um, on Zoom and I was on my porch. Because of the energy of words to remember now and always, my dreams are eager to be together with yours. 
easily Ursa major and minor. You etymologically rule my sky with your blue hyacinth royal Persian evening, which really narrates a desire encyclopedia to thank every one of yourselves, bumptiously enlightened and riddling, never not acrostically awe-inspiring, depth charges engendered to create talk, evermore matchless magic asking your imperial, rapturous, beautifully erogenous and risky, and now acrobatic edging toward the time of your enjoyous birth. May a young bird engender a nest of rare blue eggs next to a desk of yours, easily transcriptive and totally engrossed in May, the month, and April, and all the year where echinacea can be rare to bloom, to come to early risers who need to stretch a song, dancing on the embossed lawn to say to you, happy early Bernadette Earth Day to regale you now with a panoply of dear pals, entreating towards terrific escapes of momentous, astonishing bolts of gel, G-H-E-L, which you and Skeets say is yellow or green, or to yell like a nightingale out over the earth. It's really the month of your amazing birth. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leanne. Um, I feel like to, to write a line like, till you come, line break, home from school, you really have to have nerve. Thank God she did. Um, our, our, we are going to hear at this point, we're going to listen to um, uh, a, a short excerpt of an audio recording. Um, it's from a workshop that um, Bernadette gave here at the project in 2000. Uh, the title of the workshop was Everybody Knows Everything. And when we selected this passage in part because um, when we were talking with the family about what we should play, Marie said, well, I would really want something with her laugh. So. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, uh -huh. I was gonna read that. Uh, you can write sex poems while you're making love. That's the best form. But, you know, if you say that to people, they often say, I don't think I could ever do that. <laughs> like as if they were only gonna make love once. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I mean, you can make love more than once and write the poem, right? Yeah. I mean, what's the problem? <laughs> <clears throat> this would be my making love poem writing time. <laughs> Did you ask that question? Yeah. What was the question? What? what if the other person gets mad? Like while you're, while you're making love to them and you're, you're jotting down notes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, if they get mad, then you don't make love with that person again. <laughs> I would assume. Oh. <laughs> well, you'd have to make an arrangement. <laughs> I don't know, you can figure that one out, right? You just make a plan. <laughs> really, make a plan. Like, tell your mate, if it is your mate, that you're going to write a poem this particular moment. And I think that would be acceptable to anyone. Don't you feel? I do. <laughs> it just fills my heart so much, um, and I'm so happy now to turn it over to C.A. Conrad. I had a very fancy idea in the early 1990s that I was going to win the lottery 
and uh, build the poetry hotel for poor and working class poets. And um, I don't know who told Bernadette about it, but she said, she saw him, she's like, hey, CA, you know, is this true you're going to do this poetry hotel? And I said, it's only for poor poets. And she's like, oh, yeah, well, what are you going to do if some rich poet is pretending to be poor? And you know how they do that. <laughs> I said, we will, we will drive them out. Just drive them out. She liked that idea. And then she said, hey, I'd like to move in there. Can I live in there? I said, oh, my God, you have the biggest room. And we'll name the library after you. She said, there's going to be a library. I was like, we're going to name, we're, you can help us name all the appliances. They're all going to be named after poets, you know, the washing machine, the dryer, and, you know, the toilet, because she loved Catullus. I was like, you know, the Catullus toilet. But then we thought about having just a, a chalkboard, because that, the toilet, the poets named after the toilet needs to be on rotation, definitely, constantly, new poets on there. And the thing is, you know, every time I would see her, then she would say, hey, did you win the lottery yet? And I would say, no, I'm working. I've got my special numbers. I'm going to do it. And um, there was this moment where she was trying to tell me, it's funny, how, like negotiating this building that doesn't exist, you know. She says, you know, I, I, have the, I know this painter who's poor. And I was like, this is not a painter hotel, at Bernadette. And she said, what if she writes a poem once a week? I was like, are you going to write the poem for her? She's like, what difference does it make? You know what I mean? Who writes the poem? <laughs> It was just so much fun having a conversation about an imaginary building every time I'd see her, you know. Um, I've been teaching a workshop, and I've been, I took nine different poets, and I took all their books by these nine poets and just gave them to the students, and it's circulating, and Bernadette's one of them. So I, had, I realized when I was supposed to do this, like, I don't have any of her books at the moment. So I had a friend uh, photocop, take a picture of one of the poems that I was going to read, and then text it to me. So I'm going to do that. But, you know, I want to actually read an excerpt. There's a, there's a translation of Catullus that came out just about a week or two after Bernadette passed away. And it's written and it was translated by my good friend Jane Goldman in Glasgow, Scotland. She's, she's a force of nature, just like Bernadette. And uh, you would have to be to translate Catullus. So, you know, in honor of Bernadette's birthday, I'm going to read just an excerpt from Jane's beautiful translation of Catullus, and then a poem by Bernadette. So this is by Jane Goldman, the translation. Cockhead's legendary spaffed out pines seemingly swam through cunt wet waters to gold stream waves and eagle shores when a creamy young star hard crew set on filching the black sea gold pelt risk speedboating their way, their salty way, slick blades fanning blue waters. It's for them, the top city fort's top bitch herself got the cruiser cruising light breezes, fixing piney prow to bank keel. She was first to speed over the unsped sea. When she split with her beak, stormy waters and famed wave crest creamed up with foam, up from this dazzling vortex pop faces of the deep. And before I read this poem by Bernadette, I just wanted to say, uh, a handful of years ago before the uh, pandemic started, uh, I was teaching at Naropa the same week she was teaching, and Phil was there. It was a great week, always is great best place in the world to be in the summer. And um, she was teaching a class of the insult poem, and uh, Catullus was part of this. I was like, oh my god, what's this going to be like on Friday when we get to see what they're doing? And Bernadette brings in this potted plant that was in the classroom, this poor thing, this like spindly long trunk, and just like all these crackling leaves, and one really good strong leaf that's like, don't kill me, you know, like, leave me alone. Like, and she set it in the middle of the stage, and, the, and her and her her poets in her workshop walked around and pointing at like Rini's insult poems like, fuck you plant, you know, just like, and I just wanted to like take it back to the hotel room and cuddle it. I felt like so like worried about it, but um, that was fun. And uh, one of my favorite memories um, in, of my life as a poet was when Bernadette Mayer and Leanne Brown gave this amazing reading, it was packed, and um, all of a sudden Bernadette to the microphone, she's like, 
CA, are you here? And I was like, what the fuck is she calling my name for? And I was like, and I got up, I was like, yes, you know, she's like, come up, you know, I don't know who told her that I read this poem and they liked the way I read it. And she wanted me to read it. And I was walking up there. She's like, I want you to read this poem. And I was like thinking to myself, don't fuck this up. You know what I mean? Like, I felt like I did okay. She seemed to be happy with it. Sonnet. You jerk, you didn't call me up. I haven't seen you in so long, you probably have a fucking tan. And besides that, instead of making love tonight, you're drinking your parents to the airport. I'm through with you bourgeois boys. All you ever do is go back to ancestral comforts only money can get. Even Catullus was rich. But nowadays, you guys settle for a couch by a soporific color cable TV set instead of any arc of love. No wonder the G.I. Joe team blows it every other time. Wake up! It's the middle of the night. You can either make love or die at the hands of the Cobra Commander. To make love, turn to page 121. To die, turn to page 172. Thank you, CA. Um, please join me in welcoming Brenda Quiltus. Hi. I was I chose a poem about maple syrup because I know that was like such a great spring ritual, and with spring so much in the air, I just wanted to bring that into this space because. I have so many memories of Bernadette and filled everyone tending to making syrup. Syrup's up again. Day dawns gloomy, but birds have found the feeder at last. March 22nd, 2003. Of course there's a war, Bush says. The war is going well. Bill's tending the evaporator fire. Now he's cleaning and raking, things we didn't do, rake, recce, make war on Iraq. Sophie and Zach arrive, our premier evaporator tenders and mood elevators. Let's go. First I eat sweet maple syrup tapioca, birds gather in the nearby sycamore tree, then flee to eat maple syrup over LSD. Thank you so much, Brenda. We'll hear now from Greg Masters. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Poetry Project, for putting this together. Everybody for coming out. 1980 or so, I was working up there with Maureen Owen and Ron Padgett. And then um, after, Maureen was going to go away for the summer, invited me to house it for her in her nice house in rural Connecticut. I said, sure. And then the next summer, same thing. And it just occurred to me, well, why don't I invite Bernadette and Lewis and their three kids to come with me? It's a big, big enough house. I never sought Maureen's um, permission. I did, didn't, <laughs> didn't occur to me. So I've apologized to Maureen for my lapse. So while we were there, we were there a month in this beautiful salt box house on a country road in Guilford, Connecticut. And um, Bernadette and I were each keeping journals each day. And we came up with the idea, well, we'll concatenate them together at the end as a gift to Maureen. That was Bernadette's idea. I just thought I was writing journals. And uh, so 40 years later, I published the book. Nice, I don't know if you can see a picture of Max and Sophie on the cover. I have copies to give away if you uh, see me later. <clears throat> so this is a page Bernadette wrote on July 15. Can't see very well. The moon is almost full. 
We saw it rising behind pink and yellow clouds while we walked down the Dunk Rock Road into the end tonight with Marie to show her where the Queen Anne's lace grows. And we saw raspberries, two different kinds of bushes of them, it seemed. And we ate one raspberry from each kind of bush, one the normal green and the others the gooseberry semicircles, which are very close to ripe. Greg is watching High Plains Drifter. It turns me on to live beyond the nuclear family quite harmlessly. Can I say that? The pleasures of today were feeling the hot sun, not so hot anymore that you can't bear it, swimming in the relatively empty of people, lake, and turning to the sky and floating, looking at the clouds, of the inspiring puffy kind you could imagine getting exhilarated flying above. Real corn, watching Marie's pristine face, kissing Germanic Max, measure the sunflowers, eat very hot rice and vegetables, drink lots of wine, and walk Marie down the road. Greg and Lewis are kind of stodgy about excesses, though Lewis loves an excess of work, and Greg loves pleasure, I am certain. But I haven't told anything of the day. There was some sort of sea sex scene in High Plains Drifter. I didn't see it. Last night, we watched part of a mammoth TV movie about battered wives. It was all engrossing, except you couldn't continue to watch it. It was so awful. The night before, we had a long discussion about various movies ending up with all of us trying to figure out the name of the Bunuel movie, Belle de Jour, which we finally learned because Lewis went upstairs to find a book he remembered seeing on the shelf, and he passed it down to the living room through the great hole. Remember that morning? <laughs> Belle de Jour. Lewis had said, bonjour tristesse, which wasn't bad. I was fixated on Vir Viridiana, it's funny when we have these conversations, it's almost like showing off. Today's loss was the last page of all my friends are going to be strangers. It just disappeared, so no one can find the page. Then Lewis said all the books he's been reading have been falling apart. Lewis couldn't find his shorts either, and I still can't find my other sandal. Last night, Greg went out to the barn to see Sean, the horse, late, and raccoons attacked him. This was right after the wife-beating movie. It took two hours and 14 minutes to roast the chicken for tomorrow's dinner, but I have a feeling it'll be eaten before then. You see, if you don't try to remember and tell everything in order, everything will get told anyway, which is a pretty suspicious and elementary thing to even bother to say. When we came back from our walk, Peggy had called. So I called her back and we talked a long time. Lewis and I and the rest of us blood relations will leave on Monday by train. And then Grace, or Lewis, will drive her car up here to pick up our things and Greg will stay till Maureen and Ted and everyone gets back. The Castaneda book keeps saying, as they always have, that having children makes holes in yourself, in your fucking luminosity. The cats like to be padded. Now one's climbing up to me. To distract the cat, I gave it the chicken's heart to eat. Seven Queen Anne's laces, pink at the beginning with purple hearts in the center, some fallen away, will never convince me that royalty is anything but to be sneered at. Sorry, Annabelle. And all these utopias so stupidly seem to keep up some idea of royalty or the lack of it. Why do I write so much? Do I consider myself some kind of royalty? Max dumped all the cat food on the ground. Everyone's eating it now. The, the skunks have already been here. Why do I love you? Maureen's chair squeaks like a cat when you lean back. I even like the wind blowing on my face when we ride in the car its poor radiator. It takes so long to learn something. Oh, vacation. I dreamt last night I was living in a donut-shaped commune, and when I woke up, I realized 
I had to ask Grace some questions, formally, in writing. Now I've given the cat the neck of the chicken, all roasted with soy sauce on it. Wouldn't it be a measure to have everything all the time and all knowledge and be quiet? Thank you. Thank you so much, Craig. Um, please join me in welcoming Annabelle Lee. This is awful. <laughs> it's really intense. <laughs> First, I want to read the colophon page of Subatomic Moss. Typography for this lunar module was composed by the publisher on Bernadette Mayer's Smith Corona Coronet Super 12 Coronamatic in the Poetry State Forest. East Nassau, New York, spring 2021. Printed by the publisher, Philip Good drew the lunar module. Cover photo by Marie Warsh. This was during Corona times. So the fact that that Coronamatic was a Coronamatic was just absolutely insane. Um, I was spending lots of time up there um, as I had spent lots of time in Worthington and Lake Buell and Lenox and all those places where wherever Bernadette was, and then her workshop here. Um, first time was when I was living down the street on 10th Street near Third Avenue. So I'm gonna. I'm really glad Don read from <laughs> this book, um, and and so Bernadette and Phil and I came up with this idea that because it was Corona times and I was up there in. East Nassau that um, if I was going to publish anything, I should just publish little chapbooks, and it was such a great idea. So we, you know, I, I brought up a pile of like 50-something chapbooks, and we figured out how, what they should look like and how we should do it. So the first poem in this one is, You Are My Sunshine. And this is a collaboration between Phil and Bernadette. Crafting a community, mystery, sculpture, crafting an Emily Dickinson smile, denim pockets lined with velvet seahorses, belch, snow, grow up, make peace, plant trees. A colored coded alphabet forest, long neck birds grilling, rainbow trout, cigar smoking, turtles cross our path, build solar powered, wind up watches. Where is the sun these days? Have we forgotten its mysterious warmth? The sun's a local. I think we should go to its marriage to the invisible goddess down the road. Fields of honey flavored flowers, waterfalls of ice cold sangria, fresh loaves of buttered French bread, orange blue sky with salmon clouds, or orange sky blue with salmon clouds, a real collective of soft, lost parts, many common dolphins, countless krill, but there is no mouth to bring the food to. There is no sunshine in the deep ocean. Each whale pod has their own song. Ecology means different things to a smack of jellyfish riding the waves. Who smacked the jellyfish? Are they still as beautiful? If you wake up in the dark, are you singing? I sure hope fish don't have fights. Or eat the toes of naturalists who defoliate as pale winds cause lizards to fly, as Florida mangroves float by, as singing butterflies sleep at night after hearing the famous 
trills, lullaby, the minor poet's chaotic anthem, the impatient song of the major poets, the sounds of this year's riotous hurricane, a writer called Finn, a writer's cult following, falling into a sunbeam slightly, looking through the seaweed, weaving together words in dreams. Thank you so much, Annabelle. It was gorgeous. Next, we'll hear, we'll hear from Coulter Jacobson. Coulter couldn't make it out to New York to be with us, so instead sent a very, very beautiful audio recording and also a, a couple of images for us to project. So, Coulter Jacobson. Much of what I believe to be the essence of poetry and my model for the very nature of being a poet derives from my first meeting with Bernadette Mayer. I hadn't had a lot of experience with poets before then and could count on one hand the poets I personally knew, Cedar Saigo, Kevin Killian, Bill Berkson. Only much later did I learn about Bernadette and Bill's long correspondence and friendship. The few poets I'd read in high school were long dead from another time, and I didn't clearly understand that they were made of flesh and blood like me. Twenty years ago, I was in my mid-twenties when the artist Sarah Kane took Devendra Banhart and me to visit Bernadette Mayer at her home in upstate New York. I can't thank Sarah enough for having had the gumption to bring us together and the foresight to know that it would matter. Over the years, I only saw Bernadette a handful of times, but each experience was memorable. Sitting at a table on her porch, Bernadette interrupted Devendra with a jarring non sequitur. Women do ejaculate. Some of her poems were nothing but non sequiturs, so that when one thought actually followed another, it could appear surprisingly odd. Work your ass off to change the language and don't ever get famous. Bernadette was punk, but an elder punk, punk before the word punk existed. She seemed like the closest thing to an anarchist I had ever met. There was a remarkable frankness a certain indifference, a deadpan humor and sudden sharpness, and eyes that seem to take in everything. For me, Bernadette's poetry has forged a community, a network of relations between friends, all fans of her work. Everybody died, she wrote in Helens of Troy. There's nothing more to say, my hair's braided like a family. During the loneliest days of the pandemic, I read Piece of Cake, Bernadette's collaboration with Lewis Warsh. It was just what I needed, the minute details of family life and writing, the first word sounds made by Marie and Sophia, the differences in their personalities. The book made me feel like I was hanging out with my poet friends, still braided in. In 2010, my band Coconut was invited to curate a night at Grace Cathedral in San Francisco. We asked Cedar Saigo and Sarah Larson to read excerpts from Bernadette's Utopia while we played quiet instrumentals beneath their voices. From the section in Utopia titled, Something and Everything, the world had decided to forbid profit and exploitation of people and things. It became obvious that, like in nursery school, the only possible remedies for the Earth's dilemmas were to succumb to everyday genius. The word genius was changed to everything, and blatant cooperation. The word cooperation was changed to something. We also assembled a chorus to turn parts of utopia into song and to perform our rendition of By the Waters of Babylon, sung from the perspective of the Ohlone, the native people of San Francisco. As it happened, one of the singers, a friend of a friend, had written her dissertation on Bernadette's book Studying Hunger. She was surprised and delighted to be singing excerpts from one of Bernadette's books. That coincidence kept us talking late after one of our practices. Her name was Sophia Wang, and we've become good friends. Shortly after Bernadette's passing, I received a lovely letter from Sophia, addressed to Dear Friends. The letter was a marvelous cascade of thoughts and reflections on Bernadette and her meaning to Sophia and her community, 
She wrote of recording Bernadette reading her poems and making a dance to accompany the recording. Sophia included a poem from The First Free Women, Poems of the Early Buddhist Nuns. Then there was a beautiful photograph of Bernadette in her home, leaning back and laughing that special laugh, cigarette in one hand, a beer in the other. In Milkweed Smithereens, Bernadette wrote, I peeled potatoes, but peeling a really small potato, when there are limitless amounts of them, is frustrating. Peeling huge potatoes is better. These potatoes have a lot of eyes and weird things. One was totally out of the question. The first time I read this passage, I laughed out loud and then suddenly teared up. Why? I'm not exactly sure, though it may have been because I just learned of Bernadette's diagnosis, and this, set against her sentiment of everydayness, just pushed me over the edge, simply peeling a potato. Now I think of Bernadette every time I peel potatoes, looking for eyes, but especially for those mysterious weird things. On several occasions I heard Bernadette speak about her efforts to capture everything in a poem, to really be able to write everything that happens in a day, every thought, feeling, dream, fantasy, recorded as quickly as they happen. When I was a child, I thought that when people die, they get to see and know everything. So it was a strange feeling when my grandmother passed away, and suddenly, or so I believed, she knew every sort of detail of my closeted Mormon being. Bernadette didn't have to wait to die. She seemed to know it all, even in the full of life, seeing, hearing, and giving us a taste of everything. Thank you, Bernadette Mayer, for your something and everything, your eyes and weird things. I feel so grateful to Colder for that um, recording. Um, uh, our next performers are Sarah La Puerta and uh, Jared Samuel Eliosef. While Jared sets up, I'll just say um, we're so honored to be here. Bernadette uh, was a, an inspiration and a great example of how you could be, how someone could be. Um, thanks. And uh, we're going to sing two songs um, tonight that both come from Bernadette's poetry. One of them is uh, a lullaby from Utopia, a lullaby from the future for our um, nine-week-old daughter also not completely coincidentally named Bernadette. And um, I will say that uh, Bernadette's poetry has gotten a lot funnier since we've been parents. And she was about to lose her shit when Marie was talking, uh, giving, reading, giving that reading about the tantrum. I thought this tantrum poem is about to be interrupted by a tantrum, but fortunately it wasn't. Um, so that's the first one. And uh, I think we're actually about ready to go. Actually, we're not ready to go. So I'll say, a few days ago, um, I had a dream about Bernadette. And uh, in that dream, she, uh, she found a crumpled up piece of paper that was, had a poem written on it in code. And uh, the poem turned out to be just somebody asking for a Netflix password if you decoded it.
And uh, one more, this one, well, I won't tell you how we wrote it, I'll just tell you what it's called. It's called um, Song Composed of Selected Closing Lines from Bernadette Mayer's Sonnets, uh, rearranged to tell a feminist love song. Of the jewel you pay attention to becomes your baby born. A standard of nothing, love's turning no more. My list is dried up. My unannounced rhyme Your years of life away I'd gladly add them to mine To reiterate how I love you anytime So think twice, we didn't do anything Which I thought still, but without sphere her here could the half house appear in the artificial light in which she woke? Close this night, seven windows. So think twice, we didn't do anything. Tell me the rest of it. Give up everything. I want manly things and should not Women come to me return from the dead At my door with a lion with them all asking me So how can we begin again? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Wow, Sarah, Jared, thank you so much. That was really, that was incredibly beautiful. Thank you. I'm so pleased now to turn it over to John Godfrey. Uh, not a sound check, a light check. Oh, this is gonna work. Um, Bernadette was born 62 days before myself. We both were about 20 when we found out what was really going on in writing. We were influenced by things that were in the air, and we got a lot of this from these intimidating older poets who were like 23 or 24, <laughs> uh, even 11 years old. There was something very much in the air and it had happened in the 1950s, essentially, in New York, when very sophisticated and cosmopolitan poets, like what we call the New York poets, 
had derived from cosmopolitan sources a kind of aesthetic of digression. And it, personally, it, it responds to existence. If it doesn't include digression, it didn't happen. Uh, our passage of time is generally digression. It takes a very quick mind and a decisive mind to make it really come off. Another thing going on at the time would have been John Cage's prose styling. Uh, silence was all in the air. And it was during 65, 66 that Bill Bergson, this is from Bill, introduced Bernadette to Gertrude Stein. Uh, my feeling, and I send this as a warning to young writers, is when you begin writing, you sort of sleep around. <laughs> and that's going to be your idea of bed. You may think you're getting away from it, but it's going to be your idea of bed forever. Uh, Bernadette, I've heard tonight many people say, all-inclusive, anything can fit in. That takes a pretty sharp, decisive mind. If not, you might feel that there are nice pieces to this poem, but it's giving me the idea of a confused person. Reading Bernadette's, and I particularly am attracted to her harder edge writing, which went up until about 90, early 90s. Uh, I don't get that feeling of a confused person. I get a feeling of actual purity. There are going to be these idioms of vulgarity followed by beautiful lyricism, these ex-Catholic girl confessions followed by blasphemies and uh, cogitation as questions. Uh, very impressive then and now. I. Uh, had two poems. I don't want to take too long. I'm so glad this is going by with a good pace. I'm going to read one poem instead of two. And this is from the book Proper Name, which was published like 27 years ago. This poem could be 30 or more years old. It's called Essay. How carefully do we tend? How carefully do we tend, paper white narcissuses? Ashen the blossoms or pure white bulbs. I like that guy. Hell, he's a horse's ass. Like a modern day Madame Bovary, the androgyne of literary history. No vision, vision of the succinct, synced bomb to all. A pretty orderly home racked with cancerous pain. The image of a beautiful young woman foreseen with saddest eyes and in a different body. If I make the dis delicious custard, it will be filled with splinters. The person who helps me sell my Grecian vases takes half the money. I love my fantastic toys of breathless, unburnable plastic. I wish I were Shakespeare so I could be rich. And thought is thought, he said, only for those who think. When you become right, uh, wiser, you'll see you have been prettier in the past. And when you didn't know it, you were wise. Your dead or former lover fills you with desire. You move the bed back into the dining room again and eat no meat but only mashed potatoes since you still have teeth and the guts for philosophy. You do not learn Chinese but Christian melodies in Chinese class. The Spanish you are taught is said to be not Castilian. Your punk shoes were made in Korea. Your expensive art supplies are replaced by cheap computers. In your competitive classes where pure knowledge is unseemly, the bookcases you got from Gothic cabinet craft fall down. You are told they aren't meant to hold so many books. The concept of separation is encouraged by the marriage counselor, much to the dismay of the still coherent clients. The expensive eye doctor at 10 Downing Street creates a visually ugly surrounding for his patients. The idealistic lawyer is forced to demand $100 an hour for his time. The new glasses the eye doctor makes for you create mountains in the pavement and bulges in the straight glass door. You yourself are straight, but yet you are gay. Or let me put it another way. You have always been gay, 
but you have had to be straight. Often it was hard to know the difference between a liberal and a conservative. Yet you tried to fathom why your high school friends who were for Kennedy both belonged to the Young Americans for Freedom and marched in the band the bomb marches at the same time as they were fighting for independence for Northern Ireland. I really don't know what's in even the freshest bread. I've got a lease, so what comes my daily alarm? Why panic when I, why panic I when friends give me their artworks? To hang on the battered walls we argued would make landlords eternal plasterers in the inferno. Why jump I so? It's fun to jump. Was there going to be yet a big jump? Did we learn without a teacher? Does the heat of the broken invention preclude a fire? Will I be lucky this week? Will it not snow till the day it does? Will my sister finally win the lottery? Will love arrive with poetry in a cart? Will lovers assume their proper roles before the new year? Will artists begin to study again and deny the commercial? Will the schools ever begin to stand for the love of people for their children? Can even the good-looking vegetables be trusted? What shall we eat? Health food, puff millet? What will the weather be like tomorrow? Will I ever see you again? Happy birthday, Bernadette. Thank you so much, John. Um, we're now going to watch a video from Neely Tchaikovsky. Why am I doing this? Failure to keep my work in order so as to be able to find things, to paint the house, to earn enough money to live on, to reorganize the house so as to be able to paint the house and to be able to find things and earn enough money so as to be able to put books together, to publish works and books, to have time to answer mail and phone calls. Bernadette Mayer. Well, several years ago, Bernadette and her partner, Philip Good, ended up here in my garden for lunch. I think I made tuna melt sandwiches. I invited a couple of friends over, and a few strangers showed up with a couple of poets I knew. Why did they come? Well, they had all read her groundbreaking 1971 prose poem on Manhattan, Memory, with accompanying snapshots. And so they were enthralled. And it only took a few of them to fill the redwood deck. And we sat here, and there was a lot of humor and a lot of talk about poetry, both of the past and of the contemporary period. And the next night, we drove over to Berkeley, where she gave a reading before about 150 eager, young UC students. They had come for the same reasons as the poets showed up the day before at my house, because they had read her books, both the poetry and the prose, books on motherhood, books on trying to make it in an unfeeling, cold society, simple poems about living upstate New York where the snow is five feet deep and where the heat is never enough to take care of things. At any rate, after the reading, a young man came up to her and said, Bernadette, would it be okay to email you? Could we have an email exchange? And she turned to him and said, you know, that would be great. But remember, I'm an old lady. And so here we are today at St. Mark's in the Bowery, the poetry project where she was once director. 
and we're celebrating her life as a poet, as a great cultural icon, as an innovator, and as a spirit still among us, which is pretty obvious. I have a special shelf at home of Bernadette Meyer right next to my Walt Whitman books. And I have to tell you, I'm looking at them all the time. So here's to you, Bernadette. Keep on dancing. Keep on moving. Keep putting wood in the fireplace. And keep hoping for a beautiful bloom in the springtime. Thank you. Thank you so much, Neely. I'm really honored and delighted now to turn it over to Ann Waldman. Thank you so much, Poetry Project, and what an incredible gathering. It's just been so powerful and funny and uh, human and all the rest. So, so many blessings here. We're all celebrants in this amazing space, the Poetry Church, and so happy to be here with Ed Bowes, who when we were talking about um, Bernadette, he said, I saw her first. <laughs> I saw who she was first. I saw her talents and gifts. So I also want to extend uh, greetings from family in um, Colorado, extended family, Reed, of course, and uh, Ambrose, who's in Mexico, and love to the family. You want incredible children who carry on uh, uh, amazing, a lineage of humanity and love and art and all that. So, so grateful to you and to Phil. Really amazing, your incredible life together. It was so great to see Bernadette before Thanksgiving and um, went, went up with Ed and saw her as this kind of Sybil. I came in with all my holy stuff, you know, bowing. And Bernadette, what is that pious shit? That's what she said to me. <laughs> Something like that. Why are you so pious? Anyway, uh, she was a great Sybil that day. She had incredible, and Ed said something like, she reminds me of my mother. And that was my mother, actually, who first introduced me to Bernadette. She was in a class, the Bill Berkson class at the New School, along with Peter Sheldahl and Hannah Wiener and uh, Michael Brownstein and um, a few other amazing poets. But I remember her writing, she was writing me letters when I was in, still in school in Vermont and saying there's this incredible, very gifted, you know, young person in the class who's very shy, but is very happy when she's commended. You know, she, Bill had them writing all these assignments and doing readings and doing um, sort of imitations of old stuff. And she had caught Francis's eyes. So there's kind of interesting karma in all this. So I want to thank her for our husbands. I thought, how can I be funny tonight? How can I be funny? <laughs> anyway, OK, this is a letter from uh, March 1970, and we were working on her first book, uh, Moving, not the first book she had written, of course, but Moving, which was pretty early. Dear Anne, I was really happy to get your letter at the fireplace rebuilding a very hot old fire in the middle of snowstorm, car buried, stream running, and it's still warm out, but I can't see what I'm typing, your letter which I read with coffee at the stream, in the garage, and with Ed, who sings. So I thought of switching into someone else so you couldn't tell how women's libera liberation I feel, and of taking out of my pocket the letter so I wouldn't forget anything, but instead I'm trying being here. Ed's in the bathtub. It's been so nice here. I'm either going crazy or not. Drawings by Rosemary Mayer, cover by Ed Bowes, and extra information by Grace, Paul, Ed, Tom, Anne, Jonathan, Lewis, Hannah, Rosemary, Nell, Milt, Larry, Dash, Mary, Blue, Kathy, Kathleen, Grace's father, grandfather, 
Ed is burning the incense, the same incense of Jonathan's that Ed compiled at St. Gabriel's Church during the dawn of Catholicism. Tell Michael, they used to tell us we are all Catholics, whether we like it or not. That's what they said, baptism of blood, baptism of desire, baptism of total ignorance, baptism of fire martyr, but you must be naked for that. And finally, baptism of simultaneous orgasm of male dwarfs in salted frog cemetery. Now you know everything. Take it from there. And baptism of tea. Now you know everything. Take it from there. And baptism of tea plus small baptic trance, which means shivering and shaking, a shaking off. Drawings and cover could be on the title page, and so could extra information of extra stuff could be slipped into another page in the proofs. Information stinks. The next thing is me. I'm drinking. I would like to fall fail all my examinations and be thrown out of school because I get so much pleasure out of pleasing everyone and that was meant without any nothingness. Ed must enter the hospital for his submucus. I love the rhyme there. <laughs> submucus resection to correct the deviated septum he incurred being smashed by an elbow while playing football when he, Ed, was 12 or so. Either him and me will go down to the city or him and Jonathan will get all go and leave all the women up here. Either way, there'll be a black eye in the future and a strong dark woman in the future for Ed, who will, I hope, come back, but Ed's nose might look a little different. After on second thought, cover by Ed Bowes, maybe should go somewhere in the book, and my first thought was that drawings by Rosemary mayor should come at the top of the very next page following where the drawings are put. I'd like to use the three drawings beside the male sailboats which we should leave out but anyway the credits go on. It's okay with me. I think I'd like them all either inside somewhere or all on the title page. Ed up me sleep. As <laughs> Ed up me asleep. Jonathan up. Jonathan asleep. Justin go to bed. Anne doesn't want to go to sleep. Pete asleep without noticing, Cliff disappeared. Pete's girlfriend lurking around, she's a, too shy to have Ed's chocolate souffle. I'm too shy to have chocolate souffle. I'm too tired to keep the fire going. Grace is Paul. Ed, Ed, Ed. Ed is on Tom. Anne, 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 and Anne, and Jonathan. Lewis says, is Hannah, is Hannah, is, is, as it was, is Rosemary, Rosemary, Neil, 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 and Paul, Paul and Neil, milk, milk and plant, Larry, no, dash, Larry, Mary, dash, dash, mystery, mystery, Mary, blue, Kathy, Kathy, blue, Kathy, Kathleen, Kathleen, blue, and Grace is father, Grace is father, Grace is Kathleen, Grace her father, my grandfather all, love Bernadette. And this is the next letter, a little later, dear Anne, here is the book. She actually went up to get the book in Vermont. Hope you like it. We're going up to Clark's for a while, but I'll be back in the city. Anytime you get to the city, everything's fine, except right now everything seems terrible, and I hate all my work. I really want to get out of the city. Saw the Knicks game tonight, but it wasn't very good. They won. New basketball hero is Lucius Allen. Do you think Lou Alcindor would be in our movie? And then a little bit from the work we were publishing. If you start with the wrong letter, try again. The solution is a saying about a house. First a lake becomes a swamp, then a meadow. Then Nathaniel Hawthorne sent his spirit to stand by the fireplace one night after I woke up from a nap and dream about sitting on a hilltop with a smoking plate of hashish before me. He said, I found the lemon I was looking for, for tea. I've been to the opera with Vivian Lee. If you people could only go to Saturn, he went on. Surely you'll find someone there, maybe Picasso. Looking hard at me, he said, tomorrow is another 1440 evening. Then and Hawthorne showed me this, oral priest, the artist of islands, oral teachings on television, and told me to write this poem, to take a round of, to take a ride of, you take a round of, you take a ride of, and I brought, what I brought was brought by me, shortly, will for will, but fast moons, he can gather them from the air. We had lived under the same mountain, another 1440 evening, finally H told me this story. Blue Earth walks in. He looks like a Saturday dressed in orange turnips. He turns his right index finger to point to the zero on the dartboard, and he turns into a yield sign. Ed comes in and shakes Blue Earth's hand. I revoke my hands to make a song with them. Everyone applauds the handshakes, then we search maps for the location of our work and find the moon on the map of the world. Instead of saying moon, it is called even. 
Blue Earth explains to make it round the bend. Everyone whispers space to each other. They look in the corners for sounds. Then we go to a cemetery to paint peace signs and clench fists on the tombstones. Blue Earth is our leader. From time to time he faints, but recovers before we can help him. He signs his name absence. He says, I am a thematic absence of the world. H left after telling the story. He had some tea on, and before he left, he became a white chicken with a red beak. He walked across the room in the form of a chicken, walking about halfway between the floor and ceiling. Something forced my eyes to close. I couldn't open them. I'm leaving, which is why the lakes are leaving, which is why animals and sometimes people stumble into quicksands by mistake and sink. Quicksands are round floating sands, which is why a man without lips is speaking who sees without eyes, which is why a man without ears, who listens, who runs without legs, which turn over, which is why he cast his thoughts on the rocks and they began to crumble, which is why more water flows under the ground, which is why it floats between the cracks and rocks, which is why some water has been trapped underground for millions of years. It is a sea water. It is a water that used to be part of the sea, where the sea was, which is why I'm a killer, which is why my knife drills into you. Listen, whatever your name is, listen. I'll cover your bones with rocks and feathers because you're going where it's empty. Listen, the black earth will hide you. A black hut, a black box, a grave with black pebbles. Listen, your soul's spilling out. Listen, it's blue and I'm leaving. I'm departing. I'm taking my departure. I'm going. I'm going away. I'm going off. I'm getting away. I'm going my way. I'm getting along. I'm going on. I'm shoving on. I'm trotting along. I'm staggering along. I'm moneying along. I'm buzzing. I'm moving off. I'm marching away. I'm pulling out. I'm leaving home. I'm going from home. I'm exiting. I'm breaking away. I'm, oh, oh, I'm getting set forth. I'm retiring. I'm going down to the sea. I'm removing. I'm making my exit. I'm ceasing to be. I'm disappearing. I'm vanishing from sight. In doing the vanishing act, I'm departing, I'm flying, I'm going, I'll be gone, I'm passing away, I'm passing out of sight, I'm passing out of the picture, I'm going beyond the tree, I'm retiring from sight, I'm becoming lost in sight, I'm drowning, I'm losing sight of myself, I'm perishing, I'm dying, I'm dying out, I'm fading. In doing a fade out, I'm sinking away, I'm dissolving, I'm melting, I'm melting away, I'm evaporating, I'm evanescing, I'm vanishing into thin air, I'm going up in smoke, I'm dispersing, I'm dispelling myself, I'm dissipating, I'm floating, I'm ceasing to be, I'm leaving no trace, I'm leaving many branches behind, I'm leaving not a branch behind. And then just... So just, there were two other little sonnets here, where is it? Okay, this was for, just something of mine, for Bernadette's Bardo. So this was written 12, 25, 2022. Dear you in there, poetic knowledge taking place in silence. Right face deities, 26 letters experientially to infinity and written life, colored inks, illusory shadows, real evolution where people are reading you and your life circulates in us, poets' vocation, continuity of life. And red means russet in the trees. Here you down to phonemes means love in feral heat of moment. Stars of paradox mean non-teleological, composite body on pyre, oneric zones now openly, urgency of chant, lateral thinking, prophecy, alchemical torrents and bardo, wind tunnel, balance of anything is love, where form is emptiness, is heart sutra, is poem of pieces, your humble membrane singer writing this down concordant experience, not subject to form, but decolonizing mind in the seismic channel where else could we ever be? Your eyes have blazed. Where else we could ever be? Your eyes have blazed. And this is after Sir Philip Sidney. She's got my heart and I've got hers. It was fair, we fell in love. I hold hers precious and mine she would miss. There never was anything like this. My heart in her keeps us one. Her heart in me guides thoughts and feelings. She loves my heart for once it was hers. I love hers because it lived in me. I once wounded her. It was misunderstanding and then my heart hurt for her heart. For as from me on her, her heart did sit, so I felt still in me, me, my heart, heart, hurt, hurt, if both of us hurt simultaneously. And then I saw how we're stuck with each other's hearts now. Memory eternal. Uh, thank you so much, Anne. Um,
For the second time this week, it's my great pleasure to welcome Maureen Owen. Um, I read in an uh, introduction to the um, book of Vallejo's poems that in the cafes, um, someone, they'd be drinking and eating peacefully, and then someone would um, call out a line from Vallejo, and the entire room would repeat the line and call it back, kind of toast to it. And I thought, what a great idea. Um, so I, and I, I love, I love, there's so many lines of Bernadette's that are like standalone lines. They're, they're just incredible. So I picked, um, 10 or 11 and I thought I would read the line and then you could all call it back. <laughs> okay. They're not too long, so I think we're good. Oh my God, oh my God, American Express, gemütlich. Oh my God, oh my God, American Express, gemütlich. A hundred and one fillets. A hundred and one fillets. Very good. Did ferrets dig out the ennui of the slammed? Scorpions, when threatened by fire, commit suicide. Scorpions, when threatened by fire, commit suicide. Oh, you sound beautiful, like a chorus. <laughs> Thou shalt not adulterate my stinging pure afternoon. Thou shalt not adulterate my stinging pure afternoon. I love this. Or Oh, elusive sleep, where art thou gone, thou fuck? Oh, elusive sleep, where art thou gone, Very good. The night became rude when I gained consciousness. The night became rude when I gained consciousness. He had died in Humphrey Bogart's suit. How bad is the pearl's injury? A snarl of laughing violets at the ing place. Okay, and the last one is really a challenge because it's a bit long. So, if you can't do it, that's okay. It's it's a great line. I have your purse. I am at the White House. I have the edible rhyming tiger lily buds for you. I am at the White House. I have the rhyming tiger lily buds for you. Very good. Okay. That's it. <laughs> And I'm going to read a little poem from Mutual Aid. It's called Booze Turns Men into Women. <laughs> a sip of cores make children be nuclear power plant contractors. Wild turkey turns men into deer. Molson's Canadian beer makes all the people fear laundromats. Stolichnia turns women into rolling rocks. Men turn women into oatmeal stout. Jack Daniels turns men into Queen Anne's lace. Triple sec turns men into margaritas. Der Budweiser Hooven often undoes my leapin. Grand Mariner turns women into ancient mariners. Creme de Cassis creates child toxic waste entrepreneurs. Watney's weakens warriors. A taste of Genevieve turns Beatrice into a T-square. 
Martell's makes men mooseheads. Heineken's dimwit god couscous miracle elf. Gens turn men into safety pins. Chivas Regal makes men sewing needles. Black-eyed Susans turn men into Jack Daniels. Women wake from highballs as walnuts. Cocktails alienate communalis, and a glass of Schaeferl make your kid a general. And then just a couple of poems from here. Moon in three sentences. <clears throat> I did something to someone in one way so that he could do something to something. Then I did the same thing to the same person in another way so that he could do something else with the same thing. Then I did that thing a third time, this time to the thing in the same ways I had done it to the person, and this time I gave the thing to the person, and then I did it again to more than one of the things so he could do something to them in one way up to a certain point. Then for the fifth time, I did it to something that could be used to do something to do the thing which was his, and finally, I did it for the sixth time to something in the other way so that it could do something with the thing. I brought you here to round this moon. I brought you round to hear this moon. I brought this moon round here to you. I brought this moons to round to hear. I brought this here to round your moon. I brought this round to hear this moon. Then I looked at things from a different direction and came out with this moon, this moon to you to hear, your moon, this moon, I brought, I brought, I brought, I brought, I brought, I brought to round to hear, round here to round to round to hear, you hear, you round this moon, you moons, this here, this round. Then I tried to explain what I had done so far. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maureen. All right, next up we'll hear from Helen Decker. Thank you, thinking of Bernadette, thinking of you, Phil, Marie, Sophia, Max, everybody here tonight, overwhelmed emotionally, but here we go. So I was asked to read, the first poem I'm reading tonight, I was asked to read a poem that honors the collaborative relationship between Bernadette and Phil. So I chose this poem that they wrote for Gary and me when we married, and it's called Gary and Helen Together. And the first line, and I announced the first line, the first line is, hope you have a happy monkey. <laughs> From the shores of all coasts to the mountain tops, tigers and others wish H and G the best and sapidest, Bernadette Asterisk, meaning tastiest and wisest today. Their love is as great as the best Italian gooey cake maple walnut from the Bella Napoli bakery in Troy, where efficient girls giggle when they take your money. We wonder, do you call each other honey? Do you think the same things are funny? For example, does either of you think this is funny? When the executives went surfing, they had a board meeting. And what of the meeting of Gary and Helen, who decided to shack up together, two wild and crazy guys eating at Pal Joey's, who danced on the table, 
Does the food of the other always look better? <laughs> Will you dance across the yard to the creek? Will you shout for joy on the magic meadow? Wow, look at those guys. Go, baby, go, go. Come over here so we can all wish you a happy and fortuitous coupling announcement via wedded bliss. Let's all kiss and touch till angels flap their wings in glee for these. By Bernadette Mayer and Phil Good on the occasion of the Woodstock wedding, 6609. Thank you. Yay, yay to them, right? Bernadette and Phil. And then this two poems from Bernadette and I started a collaboration in January 2020, and we all know that was a different world in January 2020. So what we would do at that time is that Phil and Bernadette and Gary and I would go to lunch, and we would go to lunch in Albany and Troy and some red restaurants that you chose along the way, and we would deliver the pages to each other. Phil said this was a secretive operation, and he would open the trunk, and he'd put the pages in that I'm giving Bernadette, and then Bernadette's pages would go in my trunk and would drive away, and that's how it began. And we all know what happened two months later. So two months later, when we were sequestered in our houses, we continued the collaboration through the mail, and funny about Bernadette and email, we didn't do that, and I didn't do that either. I would hand write my poems on pieces of paper and send them to her, and she would type her poems and send them back to me in those yellow envelopes that Bernadette, if you don't know, used yellow envelopes and paper. And I would wait for those, I would wait for that mail person to deliver those, and if they didn't come, if there was a la time would go by, I, I would say, Bernadette, the spider in the mail mailbox is eating all your poems. They were lifesavers, right? They were lifelines during that intense time. So probably maybe August 2021, I sent Bernadette my final version of these poems. And these poems were based, our muse was Emily Dickinson in, a, in, in the book, beautiful coffee table book, The Gorgeous Nothings. And that was where we began. So I'm, I'm just going to read this as an intro. It's from Bernadette. These are Bernadette's words about what we were doing. And then a piece from me and a piece from Bernadette. So Bernadette says, this for the world is a first. To have written a mock translation of some famous poet's scribblings on envelopes, treated as rare shapes and sayings. To have gotten these books, unlikely, from a woman named Barbara, and offered in return what we are sending today, which is a hodgepodge, though beautiful, inspired by this poet's musings, which will at last rest in the world as what it is a hard-to-believe collaboration between two friends from here and there, Staten Island, Saugerties, New York City, East Nassau. But there were only two people, Helen and Bernadette. We title the work The Gorgeous Everythings, and with Bernadette's from the very beginning of the project and several times thereafter, Bernadette told me that we would be dedicating our work, and we do dedicate it to Barbara Epler. Stay home, says the governor of New York. Bernadette, I thought that she was wearing Armani, that a man's utensils were the communion liaison. I thought Anima embarked on a commiserating journey, a communist sort of recline. Bernadette, I thought Tuba, Tun, Ethos, Sisters, Clementines, Alma, Soap, Oslo, L, Easy, Eve, Critical, Australia, Consomme, Darn. If only the kelp would not dry out her skirt. Bernadette, what did you think? Dear Helen of everywhere, the power went out. We got so used to it. It's crazy. Now the generator has become John Travolta in some verse form. Now a power outage takes all day. Bill has an ox. It will only eat Coquille Saint-Jacques. Hannah went on a cruise once to eat that. I myself love it and scallops in any form. I always wear ink since I started drinking it in my early years. I am not married. 
I do not know Ruby or Quilly either, I mean Willie. The dish we made with scallops is called the Fendi suitcase. I did not make love or marry that. I like the sounds whales make. Grace and I used to go to the aquarium in Brooklyn every April to eat our lunch in spring while listening to the whales sound or the whales' sounds as you are. I never knew you went by Helen of Colorado. Ed Bowes is now married to Ann Waldman. They live in Colorado. She told me he likes sweet potatoes. I told her when we lived together, we never talked about food. Ed insisted we always eat out. What does it mean? We didn't even have much money, but he didn't like it for people to cook. At a bar, we would have Jack Daniels and a beer chaser, then shoot pool with Grace at the lesbian bar. I know my dream of having an indoor swimming pool, which I'd invite you to while we ate scallops on the side, will not come true. We can't even get our generator to work. Last year at this time, we were collecting sap to make maple syrup. Now, we shiver in our bed. Tomorrow, I'm reading in Glasgow on Zoom. Glasgoom, as Emily'd say. I have a date to get vaccinated in Utica in March. This isn't supposed to be funny. I hope we'll see you soon and that the weather will get mild warm. Toodaloo, Bernadette of the Clear Mind. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, please welcome Peter Gizzi. Thank you, Kay. I'm the penultimate reader. This has just been, it's been a great journey. It's really great to be a part of this and to share Bernadette's life and work with everyone here who loved her work. It kind of blows my mind. I grew up in the Berkshires in Western Massachusetts in Pittsfield, just a town over from Lenox, where she would write, you know, many great works, and, and that was the book, and the bookstore that I went to is called The Bookstore, um, was right around the corner from where Lewis and uh, Bernadette lived, and they were good friends with Matt, the proprietor, and I very well crossed paths with Lewis and Bernadette and Sophia and Marie in my early days. Um, and then a few years later, Midwinter Day came out and you know, Matt laid that on me with the story that it was written in a day. I'm like, yeah, right? And it, you know, and it was. And, but what I really loved was just how companionable it felt that she found this way to you know, immortalize you know, uh, where I came from. And it just felt so natural. And then a few years later in that bookstore, I'd meet Clark Coolidge, who would become an early mentor and tell stories about Bernadette that were pretty funny and how much he respected her work. Um, and then I got to meet her. And she, I, you know, I can't believe I forgot this, but I was sitting here thinking, wow, the first time I was invited to read at the church was from Bernadette, you know? Um, so. Marie liked the idea of me reading this poem, and um, since it is her birthday, uh, this is a poem she wrote on her 70th birthday. Walking like a robin. Take three or four steps, then stop. Look, smell, taste, touch, and hear. Is there anything to eat? Oh, look, there's some caviar. It must be my birthday, thanks. I must be very old, like 70. I guess I'm falling apart. I'll just sew myself back together, but will it last? Please take a piece of me back home. Each piece is anti-war, and don't pay your rent. In fact, remember, property is robbery. Give everybody everything. Other birds walk this way, too. Thank you so much, Peter. That was so good to get to hear. Before I turn it over to our final performer of the evening, I do want to remind you of our very beautiful blue guest book at the front, so please be sure to sign it before, before you slip into the evening. And I'm so, so grateful now that I get to turn it over to Ed Sanders.
I'm grateful to Phil for inviting me uh, to come here tonight. Um, I go way back with Bernadine Mayer to when she first flamed into the Peace Eye bookstore on East 10th Street just a half block from where Allen Ginsberg and Peter Orlowski were living. This was around 1966. I knew she was from Brooklyn, and I think she was then studying at the new school. You could tell she was on fire. She became friends with my friend Peter Sheldahl when she first arrived on what we called back then, quote, the set, unquote. As if the Lower East Side was a 16 millimeter film shooting zone. <laughs> I was amazed, but not surprised. When she began writing top rank poetry so soon, after she flamed onto the set. We salute Bernadette's bright and light shedding creativity and presence in our era. And I sure hope they find a cure for the malady that seized her. Other friends, such as the great poet Edward Dorn, also succumbed to it. Out, demons, out. I'm going to do a couple of tunes I know Bernadette liked from those early days. The first is just about the first poem William Blake wrote when he was about 11 years old. It's, on his, it's in his, one of his first notebooks. And I wrote a melody to it in Washington Square Park outside New York University in 1963. It was on the first Fugs album in 1965. How sweet I roamed from field to field in honor of Bernadette. How sweet I roamed from field to field and tasted all the summer's pride till I the prince of love beheld who in the sunny beams did glide he showed me lilies for my hair and blushing roses for my brow. He led me through his gardens fair where all his golden pleasures grow with sweet may do my wings were wet and Phoebus fired my vocal rage he caught 
me in his silken net and shut me in his golden cage. He loves to sit and hear me sing, then laughing sports and plays with me then stretches out my golden wing and mocks my loss of liberty And I'll do one more song poem by my co-founder of the Fugs, the late, great Thule Kupferberg. <laughs> and it's a sad poem in a way, but it also has a lot of secret hope and joy and creativity and the kind of spontaneous genius that Bernadette Mayer had. It's called Morning, Morning. Morning, morning Feel so lonesome in the morning, morning Morning brings me grief. Sunshine, sunshine, sunshine laughs upon my face and the glory of the growing puts me in my rotting place. Evening, evening, feel so lonesome in the evening, 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 evening. Evening brings me grief. Nighttime, nighttime kills the blood upon my cheek. Nighttime, ooh, nighttime does not bring me to relief. Starshine, starshine, feel so loving in the starshine, starshine, ooh, starshine. Darling, kiss me as I weep. Thank you, Ed, and thank you, everyone. Uh, as is 
traditional uh, uh, at Poetry Project. Don't don't leave just yet, unless you really have to. A couple more minutes. As is traditional at um, Poetry Project Memorials, we're going to end by listening to um, uh, we're going to end by listening to uh, a final archival recording, um, uh, 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 and and uh, close our evening by listening to Bernadette's voice. Um, before we do, I'm just, I just want to read out, um, we have some special thanks in our program, and I just want to note Christopher, our, our thanks to Christopher Sennett Burke, Ryan Cook, um, uh, uh, Xavier Danto, Heather Denton, Zachary Edminster, Anjali Emslin, Kayla Efros, Ashley Escobar, Dakota Evelyn, Nicole Friedland, Elena Friedman, Philip Good, Zoe Greenwell, Deb Halpern, Rainer Diana Hamilton, Michael Honigberg, Corey Hutchison, Rachel James, Jennifer Carmen, Omkar Lewis, Connie Lee, uh, Erica uh, Anasite, um, Ira Pulgar, Morgan Ritter, Jasmine Sanders, Eleni Sicilianos, Sam Truitt, Marie, Max, and Sophia Warsh, New Directions Press, and also thanks um, to uh, James Berrickman and Noah Mendoza, who've, and, uh, who've been our text tonight. <laughs> and, and to Anna Cataldo, um, uh, who's been running production. Um, and, uh, and thank you all for being here. Uh, and now, I, one final time, I give you Bernadette. I'm gonna write a poem. I might occasionally have a first line in my mind, which will have some sound to it. It might not have any particular meaning in terms of ever knowing where the poem will go, but um, something, will, something will occur to me you know, at some point in the day, and uh, it seems like that's right somehow, and I'll write it down, and I'll know that if I can take that, those couple of words, or that line, or whatever it is at that point, um, and work with it later, that it will lead to something good. I might even very rarely, but occasionally, sit down with a title in mind, and, uh, and proceed from the title. Very frequently, I will sit down with some words in mind, and write them, and wind up having to delete just about the first five lines because they were a way of working into something. Then again, there is also the always the thing going on where something is brewing inside you, and uh, no matter what you sit down to write, it's going to be something great, you know? And you don't have to begin really with anything because uh, there's enough there, but it's not really accessible until you put words on paper. Thank you all so much. This was such a beautiful, beautiful evening. Thank you so much, Kay, for all of your work. It was really such a pleasure collaborating with you. I, um, you can exit through the front of the church, but as we've reminded you, be sure to first sign the guest book before you go, and I look forward to seeing you back at the project again soon. Thank you. Have a good night.